Thank you so much for joining us today as we begin our NASMA 2022 Biocontrol Summit. We have over 600 joining us today from all over the world. My name is Christy Trifone Milhouse, NASMA's Executive Director. Before we begin, it is with great importance that we start our gathering with a statement of recognition. We acknowledge that many of us gathered here today are located on the ancestral homelands of the indigenous peoples of North America. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. Thank you. The North American Invasive Species Management Association, known as NASMA, is a nonprofit organization with a mission to support, promote, and empower invasive species professionals in North America. NASMA is a 30-year-old organization with rich history as a grassroots organization that grew into an international collaboration focused on supporting invasive species management. We have a 15-member board of directors, 10 committees with additional subcommittees, six employees and contractors, and an ever-growing membership base with over 700 individuals and organizations, and more than 7,000 subscribers and 37,000 social media followers. NASMA is growing by leaps and bounds and is available to serve and partner with you to achieve your invasive species management goals. We have three main program areas that we focus on as a benefit for our members. These include governmental relations and advocacy, prevention tools and campaigns, and professional development that includes events like today's summit. I'd like to encourage all who have not become members to do so. Your membership helps to continue to provide these incredible trainings for experts in the field to all invasive species managers across North America. I'd like to thank the USDA Forest Service who provided funding for this summit and made it possible for us to offer this as a free event open to the public. In the spirit of recognition, I would also like to thank the Classical Biocontrol Summit Control Committee, excuse me, members for their incredible support in putting together this summit. Special recognition needs to be given to Melissa Maggio, Philip Weil, Carrie Brown Lima, and past board member, Jennifer Andrews. Jennifer Andrews is our Classical Biocontrols Co-Chair and the Associate Professor, Extension Specialist, and Biocontrols Specialist with Washington State University Extension. I'd like to now introduce Jennifer. Thank you, Christy. Um, I hope you can see me and understand me. If you can't, please let me know and I will turn off my video. Um, so uh, good morning and welcome to our Weed Biocontrol Summit. Thank you for joining us. As Christy said, my name is Jennifer Andrews. I am co-chair of NASMA's Classical Biological Control Committee. We are joined today by Carrie Brown Lima, our other co-chair, and our summit moderator, Melissa Maggio, who will introduce the speakers and manage the Q&A box. We would like to thank everyone who helped pull the summit together and to our presenters who generously agreed to be here today to share their work. As Christy mentioned, this summit is sponsored by the USDA Forest Service and coordinated by NAISMA Classical Biological Control Committee members with support from NAISMA staff. This year, the summit will highlight weed management practitioners who utilize weed biocontrol within their integrated weed management programs. These regional managers and practitioners will share implementation stories, challenges, and successes. We will also hear updates from researchers on long-term implementation projects, and biocontrol agents that may soon be available. The NAISMA Classical Biological Control Committee wants to continue to strengthen and expand our biocontrol community, and your input is valuable. We will be sending a post-summit survey and would appreciate feedback on content, future events, improvements, and community growth opportunities. You're also welcome to contact any of us directly. So before we begin, a few housekeeping items. 
If time allows after each speaker, we will have a formal Q&A. Um, Q Please type questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. Is it, and they will either be answered live or answered in the Q&A box. If you are asking a question, please specifically address the speaker you would like to answer. Also, please chat any technical issues into the chat box or email Elizabeth Brown at ebrown at naysma.org and she will address the issues. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and make sure her email is already in the chat so uh, you'll have access to that. We'll also put a link to the agenda in the chat box. And with that, Melissa, would you please introduce our first speaker? Absolutely. Thanks, Jen. So we are going to kick off the summit with a couple of keynote presentations, the first of which is going to be presented by Carol Randall. So Carol, feel free to share your presentation and begin. Well, good morning, everyone. Has it gone into present? There we go. I'm gonna just kick off with kind of an introductory statements and an overview of the topic um, in, incorporating biocontrol into an integrated weed management strategy and hopefully answer some questions about how do you start. So classical biocontrol is directed against plants that invade areas outside of their normal distribution range by introducing host specific natural enemies from the native range of the plants. The objective of biocontrol is to reduce and permanently stabilize the density of the invasive plant. The natural enemies or biocontrol agents are expected to multiply and disperse by themselves. And before we can bring biocontrol agents into North America, they are extensively tested to prove that they have a narrow host range. The conceptual basis of the classical biological control is the enemy release hypothesis, where if you start with a high density of an invasive weed, the concept behind the enemy release hypothesis is that the reason those weeds are able to be at such a much higher density in the invaded range is because they've left a complement of their natural enemies back in their home range. So biocontrol seeks to reunite these invasive plants with their natural enemies. And so you start with a high population, you go back to the native range, you find some of these host specific natural enemies, bring them in, release them through time, those natural enemies are gonna become established and increase in population and start to have a dampening effect on the population of the invasive plant, resulting in successful control, which is not eradication, but is causing those weed populations to exist below a damage threshold. So with that in mind, that biocontrol is working within the system, there are some important caveats that land managers need to keep in mind as they're contemplating adding biocontrol into their integrated weed management strategies. And the first is that you don't want to implement weed biocontrol unless you have a significant population of the target weed. The other thing is that it takes time for biocontrol impact to become evident. And the amount of time can be significant and it can be variable from site to site. Biocontrol success is not the eradication of the target weed, but the suppression of the target weed below an identified damage threshold. And so in order to assess biocontrol success, you must monitor before, during, and after you release those biological control agents and essentially forever after you've released these agents. All of these caveats for classical biological control align it with integrated weed management, which is a strategy to prevent and suppress pests with minimum impacts on human health, the environment, and non-target organisms. Integrated weed management focuses on preventing problems, and it involves monitoring areas through time especially areas that are susceptible to or were recently treated for weed invasion by identifying the weeds that are present and choosing a combination of prevention and treatment tactics to keep weed populations at acceptable levels. The components of an integrated weed management program include continuous monitoring, evaluating, and reporting. 
And then as you're monitoring and horizon gazing and identifying potential problems on the horizon, conducting research and development so that way, if that problem becomes an issue on the land that you're managing, you have tactics in mind for how you're going to address that problem so it doesn't affect your management outcomes. And one of the key aspects of doing this research and development is determining injury levels and thresholds for which treatment becomes necessary. And these treatment tactics are um, in an integrated weed management system, you think about what type of treatment you're gonna use, including cultural, physical, or mechanical means, biological or pesticides, what scope of treatments are gonna be necessary and the timing of those treatments that are gonna be necessary in order to achieve your management objectives. And again, the foundation of integrated weed management is preventing problems from happening. But if the problems arrive and treatment becomes necessary, then you look to cultural, physical, biological, or chemical treatment responses. And if you are conducting treatments on the landscape, post-treatment, you're evaluating that treatment effectiveness, and then you're revisiting your treatment strategy. So that way, if you were not able to reach your treatment goals, you have ideas about how you can tweak your treatment strategy to achieve your goals um, as you go through time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different types of treatment tactics, cultural tactics, keep plants healthy or vigorous um, because healthy plants and healthy plant communities are better suited to resist invasion. Cultural treatments include things such as soil care, reseeding and minimizing disturbances. They work by making it tough for weeds to dominate. You're not gonna see dead or dying target weeds as a result of cultural treatments, but you will see more desirable vegetation and the target weeds will be suppressed. Cultural treatments are also a key component of prevention strategies. Biological tactics use natural enemies, including the host specific natural enemies in classical biocontrol to keep weed populations suppressed. Again, with biological control, the results are not readily apparent. Biological control works through time and you have to monitor in order to be able to recognize biological control success. Physical or mechanical treatment strategies are more direct and they remove weeds, you know, either with your hand or with a hoe. You can mow weeds to prevent them from flowering and you will see results immediately. However, the results may not last because the weeds may germinate from the seed bank or they may re-sprout from where you've pulled them or mowed them. And another aspect of physical or mechanical treatment tactics is they're not going to address underlying causes for landscape susceptibility to weeds. The fourth tactic is pesticides, which in the weed management is the use of herbicides to kill targeted weeds. The impact is gonna be visible in days to weeks, but often must be repeated as new weeds germinate from the seed bank or damaged weeds re-sprout. It does not address the underlying cause for landscape susceptibility to weeds, and it needs to be done with careful consideration of potential non-target effects on desired plants. So when looking at integrated weed management in the context of invasive species, integrated weed management really fits at the end of the invasion curve. Once those invasive plants have established and are part of the ecosystem, that's where the full suite and the full process of integrated weed management really fits in. But having said that, there are components of integrated weed management that are applicable at earlier stages in the invasion curve. So if you go back to the prevention stage before the invasive plant has gotten here and gotten established, your management objective is to keep those invasive plants out. And from an integrated um, weed control perspective, you wanna be using those components of monitoring, evaluating and reporting, you know, doing your research and developing strategies. You know, what am I going to do if this weed comes? And then again, implementing cultural treatments to maintain your vegetation community in a vigorous state so it's capable of resisting invasion. Once your invasive plants have emerged and you've, you're finding them on the landscape, your management goal shifts to an eradication goal where you're trying to find these individual plants and eradicating them quickly. And the components of an integrated weed management plan that are operational there, again, 
monitoring, evaluating, and reporting, doing your research, and cultural treatments, just like in prevention. But again, now you also are looking for individual weeds and trying to eradicate them. So you're also starting to use your mechanical and your pesticide control tactics. Um, as the weeds move beyond that eradication stage and your management objective shifts to managing these weeds at lower levels, again, you're not using that full suite of integrated weed management because you're not, you're still going to treat those weeds, but you are using the majority of those components, um, monitoring, evaluation, and reporting, cultural, mechanical pesticides. And it's at this containment stage, once these weeds are starting to become more prevalent across the landscape, that classical weed biocontrol becomes a viable treatment tech. So going back to our integrated weed management, the scope of treatment and these constant monitoring efforts are gonna help you define the extent of the weed problem. And then the treatments that you are putting out on the landscape should be in line with the scope of the weed problems. You know, especially if you're using an herbicide that has the potential to affect your desired plant species. In many cases, spot treatments of individual weeds can be more effective than blanket applications of pesticides if your weeds are very few in number and scattered. If you've got the ability to go out and treat those weeds instead of treating an entire vegetation community in the long run, you're gonna maintain the vigor of that community and um, the composition to be something that you want. The timing of the treatments is also important because you wanna treat when you're gonna have an impact on the weed, but before the weed has caused an unacceptable level of damage. This is especially important for mechanical and herbicide treatments. You need to be monitoring the weeds and evaluating treatment effects. If mechanical or herbicide treatments are used, you need to be revisiting and monitoring the sites that you've treated to ensure that the weed population has not rebounded and you need to be prepared to retreat if necessary. If biological control agents are released, it's important to know if those agents are present on the site through monitoring and be prepared to release biocontrol agents if the biocontrol populations are low. So evaluating the effectiveness of your treatments. Did those treatments work? And after you treat, you should be able to answer this question. And the only way you're going to be able to answer that question is if you look. Post-treatment monitoring is key to effective integrated weed management. If your treatment strategy did not achieve its goals, you do need to figure out why. Did the weeds come back from a seed bank? Did the biological control agents fail to establish on the site? And once you figure out why the treatment didn't achieve its objective, that gives you an opportunity to look at opportunities to revisit your treatment strategy and achieve a better result. So where is, where's a, where should you be using biocontrol? Um, large acreages, large infestation sizes. You're also gonna to wanna to use biocontrol kind of in these back areas where you're less likely to be using other weed control methods. You're, you wanna give the biocontrol agents an opportunity to establish and move throughout an infestation. And I, you also want to be using biocontrol agents in areas where you know that they're not gonna be disturbed in a massive way um, in, the next five to 10 years. Um, one of the common mistakes that folks will make is they will re release biocontrol agents in a weedy lot that then the next year turns into a box store. So you wanna know enough about your land use so that way you can give those biocontrol agents an opportunity to establish and um, do what they can do in the weed population. Is biocontrol right for you? If your goal is suppression, then biocontrol is right for you. If you've got years to um, see the results, biocontrol is gonna be a good fit for you. Biocontrol is gonna be a good fit if you've got a plant that's been there for a while and is well-established. Um, if you've got a new invader, you're earlier on that invasion curve, you're better off with more direct techniques. But if you've got something that's across the landscape, biocontrol is a good option for you. Um, one of the um, faults that happens with a lot of biocontrol programs is people think, oh, it's biocontrol. I can just get the bugs, dump them, and then just leave them. And that's not accurate. You do need to have some resources to, for effective biocontrol because you have to monitor to know if those biocontrol agents are working for you. Um, another thing that's nice to have with biological control is access to local experts. So why should you be using biocontrol? 
One of the things we know is that reducing damage in small areas with chemical or mechanical control is possible if you've got funds and staff that are available. But when you're talking landscape level suppression, classical biocontrol, if it's successful, is going to bring about desired ecological change over time, over large areas, without the repeated costs or treatments of the entire infested area. Classical biocontrol can be integrated with other weed management practices at the landscape scale, such as grazing or fire management. So why biocontrol? Pesticide resistance. There was a wonderful paper that came out in 2018 um, called Wicked Evolution. Can we address the socio-biological dilemma of pesticide resistance? And the authors noted that we mostly continue to use pesticides as if pesticide resistance is a temporary issue that will be addressed by new pesticides with novel modes of action. The current evidence suggests that weed evolution may outstrip our ability to replace outmoded herbicides and other control mechanisms. So how do you start? First, get familiar with the biocontrol agents that are out there and look for them. Note their presence and account for their impacts. Work with state weed biocontrol coordinators to include a biocontrol component into your weed management program. Biocontrol agents are regulated, so you will need to engage with the weed biocontrol community to ensure that there are permits in place for you to use biocontrol. And identify projects where biocontrol could be integrated with other weed management tactics across the landscapes. The local and regional coordination. Many Western states have weed biocontrol coordinators to increase the implementation of weed biocontrol in large weed infestations. State biocontrol coordinators commute intrastate with clients. Um, in the West, we have cooperative weed management areas. And these state biocontrol coordinators work with their CWMAs, with their land managers, and with the interested publics to make sure that they're getting what they need to be successful in biocontrol. State biocontrol coordinators also work with their other state weed coordinators to share information and facilitate the collection and redistribution of weed biocontrol agents. Interstate coordination facilitates technology transfer, increases the availability of needed biocontrol agents, and enables regional planning and national advocacy. When there is a need for a new or improved weed biocontrol program, land managers need to take the lead and let the responsible agencies and entities know as often as necessary. This is one case where squeaky wheels definitely get some grease. So I kind of wanted to close with um, just this graph of the Western state um, weed coordinators. I'm sure we can make this graphic available after the talk for those in the West who are looking at doing more with weed biocontrol. And then I will just close with a, a big thank you. And I wanted to make you aware of two resources. The iBioControl.org website is a wonderful resource with all sorts of information. And NASMA now has um, a bunch of weed biocontrol fact sheets. I think we currently are at 14 or 15, but there are plans to have a, a number of systems where you can get some basic information about what biocontrol agents are available for the target weed that you are concerned about. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. You really um, included a ton of information into those 20 minutes. Um, I have a quick request of our uh, attendees today. Please, if you have questions about the content of presentations, put those questions into the Q&A box. It's just much easier for people to respond to questions that way. Um, and if you have any technical questions, you can put those into the chat box. Like if you have issues with audio or visual, anything like that. So Carol, one quick question for you. Somebody was curious if uh, you would be willing to share your presentation for their use. Um, would the best thing for them to do is contact you offline or how would you like to address that? Certainly, somebody could just drop me an email and I can zip it up and send it to them. Okay, um, so that question was posed in the chat box. So if you wouldn't mind going into the chat box and typing in your email address so that they have it, that would be great. I will do that. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Carol. 
Okay, so our next keynote speaker is Carl Jorgensen with the USDA Forest Service as well. So take it away, Carl. Go ahead and start sharing. Um, I'm currently disabled. You... Ooh. Try again. <laughs> so let me try this again. Okay. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, great. Uh, screen two. Get rid of that. Can you see it okay? We sure can. Ah, perfect. Let me see if I can get my presenter mode to pop up here. Perfect, thanks. So my name is Carl Jorgensen. I'm a currently a group leader with the an entomologist um, with the Intermountain Northern Regions uh, in the US Forest Service State Private Program. So just for uh, reference that our area in region one and four is really big, um, roughly 34 million acres um, in region one. Uh, where Carroll is located. Uh, there's roughly 25 million acres of national forest systems lands, over 12 national forests and four grasslands. And in region four, we have the Forest Service has nearly 34 million acres scattered over 12 national forests and one grassland. And I concentrated my time uh, or my time in Southern Idaho. And a lot of my examples come from there. Um, uh, but it's been a real interesting last couple of decades that I've been working out here, just watching uh, the changes in the Great Basin as uh, the invasive plants move through. Um, but working with our, come on, working with those land managers <clears throat> on providing the technical assistance um, is uh, I'm going to get back up here. So I, in Forest Health Protection, our role is to provide technical and financial assistance. And you can see is to help protect those forests and grasslands across all ownerships. So we also work with BLM, BOR, and some of the other um, federal land managers as kind of our target audience. But we also work with states uh, in particular. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, Joey and and some of have worked with Utah and working with our land managers in those areas uh, within the Forest Service. Our main man land management goals are really water recreation and range. And so at least in Region 4, we've had a lot more involvement in the biocontrol aspect of, of noxious weeds. And as Carol's pointed out, there's a lot. One of our other goals is, is is to develop these desired plant communities that are healthy and sustainable and disturbance resistance. And that's where FHP really provides the technical assistance is how these disturbances interact. Uh, as an entomologist, I work mostly with the insects. Uh, I spend a lot of time with forest um, bark beetles as well as forest defoliators and we have our plant pathologists. But weeds are also an issue that we that we deal with. And more and more our climate extremes are, are beginning to um, have impacts on where our vegetation is going to end up and how our land managers are going to address them. So. But when we would talk with biocontrol, one of the one of the things I talk with land managers and this is important to get to know what their goal is. Because as a practitioner in bio, classical biocontrol, um, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on through my talk, is we really look at reducing that weed population, but Many of our goal, many of the land managers goals are really to have that desirable vegetation and that's gonna involve a lot more work once those weeds are reduced um, and get those desirable vegetation components back up to a functioning system that can help to provide those ecological services that we I just talked about. So one of the first lessons that I learned is build a good strong network. In Idaho, I've had a, op a great opportunity to work with, with these folks, and there's some great folks um, in some neighboring areas. They really help in answering questions, things that seem to work in our area versus uh, may or may not work in other areas. And I really encourage going to conferences and connecting with people outside your initial zone, just so you can have those connections in case something does pop up 
um, that has come from quite a quite a distance, let's say, if we got a new new agent. One of the things Carol also kind of talked about is keeping your messaging simple. Um, but it is yet complex. These systems that we're dealing with are very complex. There's all sorts of interactions going on. And when we put our messaging out there, um, it's easy for it to get whitewashed and as well as lost in the, in the noise of everything else. Carol said it once, I hope I see it more and again, but if your, your outcome is eradication or your goal is eradication, biocontrol is not the tool you're looking, looking for. Uh, I can't really count how many times this comes up. I would say at least once a year on some project where somebody says, they want to start biocontrol so they can eradicate a weed or er eradicate another pest. And I'm like, well, we have to back up and and re reassess what your goals are. And then the other uh, group of questions that we get from land managers and we deal with land managers is targeting grazing and biocontrol, burning, herbicides. Are these other uh, tactics going to integrate well? And it really depends, because as you're well aware, these biocontrol agents are living organisms and they need their foods and they need their shelters. Um, whoops, sorry. One of the things that I, I ran into was the uh, people wanted to release seed head feeders and they had cows all over this area. And the cows would go through and clip all the seed heads off their weeds. Like, well, I don't think this is gonna be your best options. Um, and one of the, in my, my next lesson, I would like to have you to point out is that my perspective is not necessarily what your perspective is going to be when you're talking to weed managers. And so it's really good to get a gauge of what their experience is. Um, and how, and then you can help address them and how they can look at some of the questions that they have, um, and how do they how do they want to approach their new area? I mean, we have new people all over the Forest Service right now, and it seems to be the great reshuffle is, st is still ongoing as far as, as the workforce. So when I get new folks into these areas, I really like to concentrate on and get them focused in on what has been released, wh where those releases been, um, do they need to make some new releases in different areas, and then getting them prepped to know how to look for these things because you can look at them in a book, but we have, as an entomologist, I have some real specialty tools like sweep nets. It's amazing that there's different types of sweep nets and people aren't really aware of that. Or like in this picture, uh, that's a big fancy aspirator, which is a rubber tube with a glass or a, a plastic tube connect to it. And we're gonna use that to go around and collect uh, moss. Um, and then getting people to realize that the timing of, of such monitoring is critically important because if you don't do it correctly or at the correct time, you can get very misleading results. And just helping working through the land managers of what those uh, kind of, uh, what those factors might be so they can identify and have their best successes. And then also getting them to realize that site conditions matter. And not every weed site is going to be applicable for, for your biocontrol agents. Carol talked a lot on monitoring and it's incredi incredibly important. However, so a lot of my weed managers that I work with, they have other job duties and they have several weeds and they're not gonna get to all their monitoring that they wanna get to. So how do we focus that? Um, the questions, this is kind of a list of questions that I go through with each of those land managers to make, to make sure that they're maximizing their efforts. And so that also they can have successes and tell those stories to the district ranger and any of those um, ranchers or land users, users that they have regarding the, uh, the land use of their district. Um, as well as that monitoring, I also try and give them in the focus like, are they, do they want to know what the levels of the biocontrol agent are? Or are they really trying to describe the success of their programs as in uh, how many sites have they monitored? And are they looking for establishment in every drainage? 
and then establishment of the biocontrol agents in every drainage, and then mark that as a success so they can continue moving on to additional work priorities. Um, other lessons that I've learned, let me do a time check here, uh, is to really slow down. Uh, one of the good ways that I've learned learned this is doing uh, field collection days. Um, it really benefits some of our weed managers stop and, and kind of shut out these other distractions that they have going on to concentrate on what it is that's happening. This the 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 series of pictures in this slide is from the Idaho City ball fields where we had cyclopleanos and spotted knapweed. Um, we had heard that they were going to pave over this area. And so for at least five or six years, we tried to collect every SIFO off of this particular, particular little chunk of ground. We have yet to do so. Uh, we hammered it the first couple of years and it just seems like we didn't even put a dent in the population. The other thing I learned from this, uh, from these field collection days is that Bigger insects, big showy insects that are easy to handle, make great demonstrations and help pe help our folks connect with those agents. Um, another th another little lesson is as we slowed down and looked at these larger agents, um, they have diurnal tendencies. So up in the top left corner of the screen, early in the morning, they're stuck wrong the root, root crown. And then by afternoon, they crawl up into the canopy and then we can use different tactics to collect them. And just having those folks go through those efforts to see how it is that they these agents move throughout the day, help them understand um, where and how to monitor for these agents so they can get good information when they do do their monitoring. Uh, let's see. And regardless of how many times I go, I have that session and those people attend that session and I tell them when you release these agents, you want them in big open fields with maximum sunshine so you get the most heat and they will do well. The following week I get taken to this site. This is a forest stand up uh, and it's probably shaded probably two thirds of the day. Um, and this is where they had released it release the the cyclocleonis. Now, at first I shook my head. I'm like, well, I guess mistakes happen sometimes, but to my amazement, we en did end up finding uh, one cypho hiding in the, uh, uh, that had emerged. So things will work out. Um, another lesson learned that is to keep your eyes open. Once these things, once these biocontrol agents get established, they move and they can move quite a ways. If you're not familiar with, with this uh, agent, this is the Agapita. This is a sulfur napweed rip moth. Uh, previous years, uh, we I had worked with the Sam Chalice National Forest, which is kind of east, east central Idaho, tucked up along Montana. We've had seen Agapita up there the previous years. We had done some monitoring over there. Um, and then the following week, I went to the west side of the state where there really hadn't been any releases that we were aware of. We're driving down the road and I happened to catch this guy out of my corner of my eye. We had, the nice thing is that they're bright yellow, so they do, they do stand out. After we did a little digging, um, this the closest known release of this agent was probably 25, about 25 miles uh, over a mountain and down into another drainage. And this guy happened to be about 2000 feet in elevation above where the release was. So these things are moving and they're out there. So it's best to keep your eyes out for them because you're, you're probably gonna find them. However, I'm still looking for this in McCall, which is about another 25 miles and a little bit of a different, uh, and up at another, another thousand feet in elevation. So they still have some room to move, but I wouldn't be surprised if they start getting there soon. So if you take note of the date in the corner here, this is a mid-June mid -June snowfall. And this land manager was very concerned about uh, the, to the yellow toad flax stem weevil uh, surviving the snow. 
And one of the lessons learned here is that our, our agents are actually pretty tough and they can tolerate a lot of different extremes. Um, they're a little cold and a little wet and moving a little slow, but they were able to, they persist just fine. I was back there this last year and there's this population is still doing well. And this one, patience, is probably the hardest lesson to learn. So, Brady Aroa is a rough skeleton weed, rough skeleton weed, root moth, excuse me. Uh, and it was first being released in the early 2000s, give or take. Uh, we tried neonate transfers onto root crowns, planted uh, uh, pots, uh, and we waited, and we didn't think, we really hadn't seen a lot. And then after 10 years, we found a, a very good population. Um, we were really amazed. And then we saw the, the amount of moths that were there. Um, and we're like, we should be seeing impacts. We There's roots with a dozen moth larvae on there. How are we not seeing impacts? Well, it's because we weren't patient enough. And if we had waited another 10 years, it sure looks like the rust skeleton weed has, has, taken, has, has taken a decline. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where this goes in the future and how the, how the ecosystem is going to respond to this, this new opening. But it, take, but it took 20 years to get from releases to where we saw impacts. And in that meantime, we've had full-on careers of or people move in and out of these positions and, that, and never got to see the impacts that, that we were going to talk about. And some, sometimes it does happen pretty quick. In 2012, we did a little, it was part of a, a study to figure out how it is to collect those Freddie Rowe and get them moved. And one of the concerns that we had right as it was um, uh, getting established is that we had a, uh, had the 2016 Pioneer Fire, which was 190,000 acres. Um, it basically burned everything on the south. This is pictures facing north on the south side of the river drainage there. And I was very concerned it was going to go right over our one plot, our one insectary site that we had. Fortunately, though, um, our moths seemed to do just well, just fine. And uh, the fire kind of moved, missed the main site um, by about half a mile, and we got a little lucky. So just some lessons in communi communicating our biocontrol successes. Um, that, oops, yeah, same slide as before, kind of. Um, published peer review is great and necessary. And it's the backbone of what we use to, to describe what is going on. Um, and it's also decided. But I have yet to have any county commissioners tell me they're reading scientific journals on a regular basis. I do have, however, the perspectives of the land managers. And this, this picture was sent to me by uh, one of our weed managers who's all upset that the leafy spurge is the yellow in the front of the photo was there and he wanted to go on spray it. Well, had he looked at his pictures from 20 years earlier, he'd see that there's yellow all the way across the back hillsides. But that's not what he has when he's talking to his rancher. So he's got, I gotta be able to equip him with the, sto the story and the background to help describe what he sees he's going on with the leafy spurge as he has the, um, the target audience right in, right with him. And then one of my other favorite success stories, and I think this one hit pretty, landed pretty well, was I received this email in 2015. I'll let you read it on the screen. Um, but essentially the spray day was canceled because our biocontrol agents were so, did so well. Now, I wish this would have been promoted a little bit more, but it did hit our county commissioners and as well as the county weed uh, association group and a pretty broad audience in the, in the area. But when I get emails like this, it kind of just makes my heart tickle a little bit to know that the managers have been, um, are aware enough to see what's going on and then help provide that story. And lastly, when it all comes together, no matter 
how happy someone might be to get a cooler full of bugs, some other people are just are not going to smile for you. Um, and with that, thank you. And if there's any quick questions, or I'll take a look at them in the chat. Thank you so much, Carl. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences. I think it's very beneficial. Um, okay, so if you can stop sharing, we will now move into our Western region presentations. And our first presenter for the Western region is Amy Lisk Thomas with um, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Oops, stop sharing. Good morning, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, Elizabeth, I, my, uh, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. My name is Amy, thank you. <laughs> my name is Amy Lisk Thomas, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Northwestern Montana, currently acting as the manager for National Wildlife Refuge's waterfowl production areas and a network of easements. But I'm also the biologist and have been for 20 years in this area. And I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about my experience with biological control in my integrated weed management program. Um, I think it's important to note that this presentation is not a scientific one, but rather just um, a review from experience on the ground. I also think I'd like to state that during my tenure at the National Bison Range, um, I got a lot of this information, but on December 27th of 2020, the National Bison Range was restored to tribal Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal ownership and management. And um, I'm since I'm stayed with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I'm only a partner with the tribes now with respect to management. So when I arrived on the scene at the bison range around 2000, there was already a long, rich history with biological control and integrated weed management in general. The use of biocontrol agents began on the bison range in 1948 when a batch of beetles from the genus Chrysalina arrived at the horticultural station in Corvallis for release, but the uh, Forest Service agent at the time could not locate the county weed agent who knew where the release was to go in the Bitterroot, and so he knew of an infestation on Ravalli Hill and put them on the boundary of the Bison Range Refuge. He put 3,000 beetles, and the managers noticed um, the post-release effect through reduction in vigor, followed by reduction in density and infestation size where the beetles had been released, and it piqued the interest who, of the manager at the time who continued to grow the program with at least 10 more releases of Chrysalina before 1954. Hence, the program was born. Since 1954, 1948 rather, um, we have 24 species of insects working on 10 species of noxious weeds. And I, I think I might be missing some that these are um, releases and ones that we actively monitor and or manage. Um, most notably, uh, that I will not be talking about, purple loosestrife, and also um, spotted knapweed and yellow toad flax. I think we'll, I'm gonna focus more today on St. John's wort because it's a classic story and my work with Dalmatian toad flax. I believe that all of these agents or combinations have been and continue to be an effective part of controlling the target species on the lands that we are managing. In some instances, Dalmatian toad flax, St. John's wort and spotted knapweed in particular, um, biological control is now the only method we employ. Um, there are other situations like musk and bull thistle, 
purple loosestrife, poison hemlock, that we continue to use herbicide and mechanical means in conjunction with the program as part of our integrated approach. So IWM was going on long before I arrived as well. Managers used grazing systems, fire mowing, methods for reducing seed sources and spread, clipping and spraying as early as the 1920s, and we continue to do all of that today. After many years of using these techniques, however, things like ineffective herbicides, herbicide resistance, steep rocky slopes thwarting access, the changing climate, and an increased need to protect rare prairie ecosystems were major driving factors for managers to seek new solutions. There are always challenges to implementing a successful IWM program, um, not the least of which for us is small staff and insufficient funding or small funds. But other hurdles include public perception, um, everything from scientifically based opposition to fear, um, hybridization where the bugs don't work as well after you know, in certain areas, um, access to agents, environmental conditions, environmental compliance, um, and other risks that go along with time in the field. Like, you know, for us, we have biting insects and predators and steep, uneven terrain. But establishing a robust biological program has overall reduced the time, labor, and cost of the inter of our weed management program and increased the safety of our staff when managing multiple species of noxious weeds. So I want to start by just briefly talking about the St. John's Wort history on the National Bison Range because it is a classic success story. And then I will talk more about my experience with Dalmatian toad flax before concluding. Um, the first patches of St. John's wort were discovered on the bison range in 1924. And after 20 years of integrated attempts at control, the pests continued to proliferate. So when they learned of the accidental release on the border, managers happily accepted a new idea into their routine and followed with multiple releases between 1948 and 54, followed up by Agrilis hypericae in 1955 and later Aplicera in 1989. St. John's wort was reported to be widespread across the region and the West, and it took some time for the agents to take effect, but that they did. Refuge narrative reports for decades tell the story of a textbook predator-prey relationship that seems to swell to a peak with St. John's wort dominating over 8,000 acres of prairie out of the 13,500 that are grasslands on the bison range in the early to mid-1990s followed by a sharp collapse in 1997 to only 400 infested acres. The predator prey cycle continues with these species. And the way I see it is about a 10 year time frame from um, peak to valley. But um, even the peaks at this point are more in the 2000 acre range on a bad year. Um, and it, we have not had to use any sort of other integrated tools or have chose not to use other integrated tools for nearly 20 years. Uh, the program included multiple subsequent releases after those initial years, which was time spent collecting and redistributing the beetles to area where they saw a need, including significant and continuous monitoring and also mapping. Um, we don't do that anymore um, as much. We do monitor. And I you know I like to look at the um, root crowns in the spring, to see if I can predict what kind of year it's gonna be. Um, they're really chewed up if it's gonna be a good die off year. Um, but yeah, so that's one success story for our books. So now um, Dalmatian toad flax at this around the same time, just as the chrysalina beetle was seemingly 
toppling the St. John's Wort problem, Dalmatian toad flax was readily establishing across the refuge, which until 1994 had only been managed by chemical or mechanical means. In 1994, the biological program was launched with Percyptorolis, followed by two more agents in 97, and finally Messinus janthaniformis in 1998. Uh, simultaneously, managers were using um, application of Tordon. So this site was sprayed in the late 90s. And this, oh goodness, I didn't put the date on there, Melissa, but is mid 2012, I'm going to say 14, on the upper left. And it's quite heavily infested again with Dalmatian toad flax. And this is uh, one of our biocontrol days where we have volunteers and a number of um, other agency officials helping us collect and redistribute. So um, we used aerial application on the steep south facing slopes because Dalmatian toad flax at the time was considered not to have biological agents that were effective. And it was a formidable threat to the diversity of the ecosystem, forage and shelter for the trust resources, which were bison and birds respectively, and as other native species that inhabited the refuge. Unfortunately, the herbicide treatments gave way to secondary invasions of cheatgrass. And by 2004, the Dalmatian toad flax had reestablished the same areas that were sprayed. So the issue felt insurmountable, but the silver lining for me occurred when I was working with an APHIS technician who was monitoring Messinus janthanus or janthaniformis. At the time, we thought it was janthanus, but anyway, um, sites across western Montana. We noticed several of the sites on the bison range were crashing, which meant the bugs finally outnumbered the plants, and the difference in those sites was stark. Native grasses and forbs were rapidly rebounding, and oh, ah! Ooh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, focus. Um, the native grasses and forbs are rapidly rebounding and it spurred a desire to bolster the program because unlike Chrysalina, the Messinus janthaniformis seemed to move less readily and we chose to use a more hands-on approach. So instead of releasing a few bugs and waiting a few years, we put multiple releases out in the same spot for two to three subsequent years at several locations across the refuge and monitored annually for presence, absence, and infestation vigor. And after a couple of years, if the vigor was reduced and the presence of bugs was increased, we would collect and move bugs to another spot. I was introduced to a few different ways to monitor these populations, which is such an important piece of the um, Messinus janthaniformis program for us. And we settled on a combination uh, or modified version as a means to make the process for selecting site, sites for collectability or release, or um, consider them stable. And we used counts and um, vigor. We, we get a group together, we would calibrate ourselves by counting um, together the bugs for a while until we felt like we were all calibrated. And then we would follow the monitoring process, mark the site, either, um, it, well, I did this so often that it got to the point where it was, if, if the counts were over 150, it was considered collectible. If they were 50 or 75 to 150, it was considered stable. And if they were under 75, we considered it for release of additional bugs. And we did that annually for several years. And by 2013, the pendulum swung and the system we had put in place was working. This is um, a 2011 to 2021. Uh, I'm saying that in 2013, the pendulum swung and it still is working in our favor uh, you know, six, seven, eight years later. And as another example on another spot, and this is, um, you know, I'm just gonna finish up by saying we recognize that biological control is 
for established species and it helps us maintain diversity and a balanced long term without additional secondary effects from tactics like widespread use of herbicide. I want to give a quick shout out to Jody. Thank you for all your help. This most the two of us do most of our work. And collaboration is key. Implementation takes a team, and I have had a lot of help. So thank you so much. That's my contact information for future questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, just real quick, there was a question for you in the chat box about sharing your monitoring protocol. And so I know that one maybe would get lost since it was in the chat and not the Q&A. So I just wanted to let you know about that. So if you could potentially go into the chat box and respond to that person. Thanks, Melissa, I will. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. That was great. Uh, I have lots of questions for you, but we don't have time. <laughs> so our next presenter is Phil Weil with Cabby Switzerland. Thank you, Phil. Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, I'm assuming screen is all good. Yeah, yep, so it looks great. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I will be talking to you today about uh, Western wheat and the new agents. Um, and these are agents that have been developed through Cabby and are in the petitioning process. So just a quick background of CABI. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization uh, established by United Nations Treaty Level Agreement. Uh, we are not owned by a single entity, but rather our member countries, which have an equal role in the organization's governance policies and strategic direction. Uh, we have staff across the globe at uh, 26 locations worldwide, and we address issues uh, of global concerns, such as food security, food safety, uh, through research and international development. In addition to our research and international development, we're also a major publisher of scientific information, which include books, ebooks, digital learning, compendia, um, and various online information resources. These are our member countries currently. Um, and as you can see, we have a wide range of member countries from developing countries all the way through to well-developed countries. And this is where our staff are located. Uh, the yellow dots um, are where the offices are, and the Switzerland office is obviously based in Switzerland. So within the Swiss team, uh, we have the Weeds team, um, which includes uh, Harriet, myself, uh, Patrick, Sonia, Gislaine, and Evo um, as project scientists. Um, and then we also have uh, technical assistance from Florence, Conta, Cornelia, and Lorelin. And in addition to that, we have five to 10 temporary research assistants uh, each year that come as summer students from uh, across the globe as well. So in the WEEDS team, we're currently actively working on 19 WEED uh, biocontrol projects for North America um, and one for South Africa. And I'd just like to point out here that we don't necessarily work in isolation. We collaborate um, quite a lot with other entities within Europe, uh, including BBCA in Italy and the USDA ARS lab EBCL in Montpellier. So today I'll be introducing you to some uh, new agents um, on flowering rush, uh, on hound's tongue, uh, Russian olive, uh, Lepidium drava or hoary cress, and oxide daisy. I'll also touch right at the end on Dyer's Word with one of the agents, which um, we do have a petition, which is very close to submission. Now, this is a slide uh, thanks to Joe Milan from the Bureau of Land Management in Idaho, um, who prepared this as a risk assessment and permitting process in the US. Um, so essentially the pre-release information that we collect, um, which regards the safety and efficacy of agents is then packaged into a petition, um, which is essentially um, requesting a release in, in the US. That petition is submitted to the Technical Advisory Group or to TAG, who then makes a recommendation. Um, so TAG will either recommend an agent, um, they may also recommend more research, which then means it gets kicked back uh, to pre-release uh, research, um, or they may reject uh, the petition, which again gets kicked back to pre-release and we end up at the um, back at the chalkboard. 
But if TAG does recommend release, it does not necessarily mean that a permit for release will be granted. Um, it just means that it, it essentially goes to the next stage, which is into the APHIS uh, PPQ system. And what APHIS does is they'll consult with various states and regulatory um, officials, such as USDA, uh, sorry, such as the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, and various other entities. Um, and then either an environmental impact statement uh, is needed. Um, or finding of no, of no significant impact. And if that is found, then uh, typically a permit is issued. Okay, so moving on to the first um, agent that I'd like to introduce you to is Vegas nodulosis, which is a weevil on flowering rush. Um, and during our impact experiments, we've shown up to 50% uh, below ground biomass reduction, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so the host specificity tests for this agent were completed uh, and the petition was submitted in April 2022 by Jen Andrews and Rob Bauscher. Um, in July 2022, approval for release um, was given in Canada um, and release was recommended by the Technical, technical Advisory Group uh, in July 2022. Um, and with that, the first weevils were sent to the USDA ARS lab in Sydney, Montana. And uh, fantastic news, they have been able to establish a, uh, a rearing colony in quarantine, which will hopefully uh, be available for future releases once a permit for release is hopefully granted. Okay, moving on to the uh, second agent, um, Assyria angustifolia, which is an area of fear mite that attacks Russian olive. Um, it particularly only attacks the reproductive output of the plant um, and should hopefully reduce seed output. Uh, in our impact experiments in the native range, we record up to 60% uh, reduction in seed output. So this work has been conducted um, both at CABI in Switzerland, uh, but in collaboration with Iranian, uh, Italian, so it's BBC again, Turkish and Serbian scientists. So a joint petition was submitted in 2019 uh, by Tim Collier with the University of Wyoming and Rosemary Declare Float uh, with AFC in Canada. And TAG recommended release in May 2020, um, while Canada approved release of this agent in March 2022. So it's currently uh, with APHIS and we've been notified that it's under tribal consultation. Um, so we'll hopefully have a decision uh, in the near future. Um, with the approval for release in Canada, we did send a culture of the mind over to uh, Rose's lab uh, in October. And we have establishment um, of a colony in quarantine, uh, which has been confirmed, which is absolutely fantastic news. And the next agent is Dicarampha aretana on oxide daisy. This is a root mining moth, um, which typically has one generation per year with adults emerging in the spring. And the larvae mine in the rhizomes and the stem base during summer and autumn, uh, and then overwinter uh, within the rhizomes. And during our impact experiments, we've shown roughly 40 to 50% reduction in both biomass uh, and flower head production. So a joint petition uh, with uh, the US and Canada was submitted in 2021 by Jeff Littlefield uh, and Rosemary Declare Float. And the TAG recommended release of this agent in June, 2022, um, while in July, 2022, Canada um, has already approved release. And uh, the first releases are planned in Canada in the spring of 2023. So the next agent is Mogulonis boreganus um, on Helm's tongue. Uh, so this is a seed feeding weevil that's capable of reducing seed output by uh, up to 50%, which is uh, really great. Uh, typically there's one generation, um, one generation per year with adults emerging either in the autumn or the spring. There's a, there's a cohort that will emerge in the autumn uh, and then a second cohort in the spring. So the petition uh, was submitted to TAG uh, in the US uh, in 2020 by Mark Schwarzlander with the University of Idaho. And in February, 2021, uh, the TAG did recommend uh, release. 
So we were also notified, uh, similar to the Assyria and Gustafolia uh, petition, that this is currently with APHIS and it is under tribal consultation. Uh, so we're hoping to have uh, to have that move forward in the near future. So the next agent is um, Sotrankis Kodaria with Furi Chris uh, against Furi Chris, and this agent has a fairly long history with uh, with the tag. Um, the first submission uh, of a petition was in 2011, and at that point, TAG did request additional tests. And this was largely based on the fact that this agent has a relatively broad physiological host range under no choice conditions, but a narrow host range under ecological, um, sorry, and, and a narrow ecological host range under more natural conditions. So when we expose plants either in open field tests or in larger cages, um, we find much less attack. So based on the results that we collected um, in the following more or less decade, um, a petition was resubmitted uh, by Mark Schwarzlander with the University of Idaho uh, in January 2020. Um, the tag responded that they could not recommend release uh, without reservations. Um, so essentially that petition got kicked back to the pre-release. And currently we've dealt with most of the, or several of the reviewer comments um, already. And there were some proposed additional tests by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, on some threatened and endangered species, which are currently underway, and we hope to, to resubmit a rebuttal um, in the near future. So the final um, agent that I'd like to talk to you about is Sotrankis parent Hoffi, which is on Dyer's World. Now, this is a seed feeding weevil um, with considerable impact. Um, we've reported up to 97% seed reduction under certain circumstances, which is absolutely fantastic. And this species under no choice uh, OB position tests, uh, which were conducted between 2009 and 2022, um, with 124 species, of which 90 were native to North America, um, including eight threatened and endangered species. Um, we find that it has a very narrow physiological host range. So we've only had development on three uh, North American species, and this is only under no choice conditions. Um, when we expose the same plant species under cage or open field tests, um, this agent does not attack them whatsoever, so it has a very restricted realized host range. So we do conclude that this is a, a safe and effective agent, and we are currently preparing a petition which should be submitted um, in the near future. So if you are interested in keeping up to date um, or, or learning about the tag, um, the tag and petition process, I would um, really encourage you to have a look at the US, uh, USDA APHIS uh, website um, where you'll find um, various tag uh, manuals, uh, procedures, flowcharts, et cetera. Uh, what you also find is, is quite a cool table, which um, essentially just uh, lets you know where the petitions are and in what process uh, and hopefully how long they'll take before a decision um, is made. So again, I'd just like to uh, thank all of our uh, collaborators, um, funders, partners. Um, without them, the work that we do would not be possible. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll gladly take any questions if you have. Thank you, Phil. That was some great information. You know, I don't see any questions specific um, to your presentations. If anybody has any, please type them in and Phil will monitor that and answer them as they come in. Just a quick announcement before we start our next presentation. Please, if you have any questions that are not related to issues with Zoom, post them in the question and answer box, not the chat box. And if you will be responding, or excuse me, answering any of those questions, you go to that question and you click the type answer box. And that way the questions and answers are grouped together. So there's not a bunch of posts, um, disjointed questions and answers. Thank you so much. So now we're gonna move into the Southeast region of the United States. And our first presentation 
um, is from Carrie Minter from University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Thanks for being here, Carrie. Thanks for having me, Melissa. I'm happy to be here this well afternoon for here us on the East Coast. Uh, and so we're gonna I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about kind of bridging that gap between biological control research and landscape level imp implementation, right? Is where everyone wants to be. We want to get these agents out on onto the landscape and doing what we have um, the what we need them to do. Uh, in the southeast, we have um, our fair share of weed problems, just like uh, everyone else uh, does. Uh, these are some of the, the big ones that we have biological control agents for. And uh, so I'm going to talk about two programs specifically today, but uh, as you all know, we all have our hands full. And so um, uh, these are just kind of some of the ones that, that we're looking at or what we have agents for. In uh, Florida, we actually have two labs who uh, are uh, dedicated to developing biological control of weeds agents. And uh, the first is the UF IPIS uh, lab that's over on the left, and that is the facility where I am based, and that is in Fort Pierce, Florida. And then on the right is the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Lab, and that is down in Broward County, Florida. Uh, typically at UF, we have anywhere from one to two scientists that are focused on bio classical biological control of invasive weeds. And at the USDA, they typically have anywhere between three and five scientists that are uh, focused on weed biocontrol. Uh, currently, across the two labs, we're working on uh, at least eight weed targets. We have multiple natural enemy species uh, in differing phases of their development, ranging from uh, just starting host range testing uh, and, and you know, uh, looking for them in the native range, all the way up to implementation. These two labs work very closely together on, on, I would say, maybe all or almost all of these projects. Now, when it comes to mass rearing and releasing, it's not just the two labs that are able to do this or who partner with us to do this. And so we actually have three labs that are doing this one being the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, which is in Alachua County or in Gainesville, Florida. My lab, which is uh, kind of on the on the very edge of South Florida in St. Lucie County, and then of course that ARS lab down in Broward County. Uh, so three labs that can that uh, are really focused on mass rearing and getting these things out of the landscape. So we're very lucky on that aspect. So after we get through the regulatory process that a lot of people have spoken about today, uh, we need to be able to rear these approved agent in, agents in sufficient amounts to make an impact. And then to get these insects in the hands of the people that need them. So uh, that ranges, of course, from homeowners, growers, land managers. And, and as you all know, there are lots of people that need and want these insects. Uh, many of the previous speakers have spoken about how biological control can be one of the you know safest and most impactful ways to manage these landscape level weeds. We just need to be able to get them out of the landscape effectively. And I think that we've done that fairly well down in Florida and down in the Southeast. And so I'm gonna talk about two of the programs that, uh, that we've had down here. So the coordinated programs I'm gonna talk about today are for air potato with the air potato leaf beetle, which you can see over there on the left, and then Brazilian pepper tree and the Brazilian pepper tree thrips that you can see on the right. First, we'll talk about air potato. Air potato is a climbing vine from Asia. And it has completely clobbered Florida and is very problematic in many of other states of the southeast, particularly Louisiana. Texas also has a ton of this weed. We have this, um, this beautiful red chrysomelid insect, so uh, it's very charismatic, uh, big red. They actually squeak, and so people really love these. They're really great to be able to like go and talk to the public uh, and get them interested in biological control. Another bonus of this insect is extremely impactful, and you can release as few as ten beetles to get them established in an area. So these, uh, this insect was a, a developed by the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Lab, and the release permits were issued back in 2011. Now, when we talk about trying to get these things out on the landscape, uh, this program, their coordinated program in order to get them out on the landscape was started in about 2014 and was actually uh, retired back in 2021. 
we collaborated, the three labs collaborated with extension agents in order to be able to reach the people more effectively. In order to do this, we developed a website where people can actually go onto the website and request beetles. So put in name, you know, location, and uh, put in an actual request to get these beetles. We also um, developed brochures, posters in multiple languages with temporary tattoos. Like we really tried to uh, really focus on that kind of extension point, um, component, getting people excited about these insects. Uh, we then of course took these brochures and posters and temporary tattoos out to extension offices throughout the, the state and the region, um, public festivals and things uh, in order to, uh, to directly talk, talk with the people in order to, um, for the list, we actually divided the state into two uh, areas. So we have uh, area two, which is uh, the brown in the in the top part, and then area one is southern Florida in the green. And the labs broke down the list based on the area. So area two was covered by the Florida Department of Ag and uh, UFIFIS. So we dealt with all of the homeowner land manager requests from this region. And area two was covered by the ARS lab uh, due to proximity. And this seemed to work for us for getting these things out. And we got these beetles to people in all sorts of ways. We actually physically put them in boxes and mailed them. Uh, that worked well. Uh, it's a little expensive, but it works. Uh, we also sent them to uh, extension offices where people could pick them up directly. Uh, and sometimes we would physically just bring them to people depending on um, where they were. But so we divided that list up and there was a lot of people on that list. And so we were happy to have uh, three labs working on that. What we also did were uh, beyond the list was we did what we called air potato challenges. This is where we uh, it was it was a day long event where we collaborated with local extension agents throughout the state in order to uh, bring the beetles to the people. So we would put out a press release in advance. And so things would be put in newspapers and on social media uh, for people to come to learn about the beetles and to be able to take beetles home with them. Uh, we asked the participants to, to bring a little cutting of their plant to make sure that it was indeed the air potato because there are a couple plant species that are very similar. And the beetle, of course, is so specific. And so uh, if you have something that's not air potato, the air potato beetles aren't going to do you any good. So we asked them to bring in some air potato with them. Uh, we could answer any questions they had. We could address any concerns, uh, teach them how to release, and then we would send them home with the beetles to, uh, to release on their, on their lands. This program was very successful. Uh, in Florida, we released uh, nearly 1 million beetles uh, in all 67 counties across Florida. So very, very successful in getting these things out on the landscape. Um, the Florida Department of Ag also released in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. And so uh, there was a partner that was focusing on, on releases outside of the state of Florida. But this uh, these beetles are well established in, in the state definitely in the state of Florida and in the region and in Florida are causing major um, reductions in this in this plant species. Along with the decline of the actual plant, which is what we all want, we also wanted to know uh, the level of satisfaction of, of people, right, of our stakeholders in the program. So we surveyed the people who participated, we got 201 responses. And overall, we got uh, very satisfied or satisfied with both the program as well as what how the beetles were doing out on the landscape. Uh, we do have a couple uh, here in the not satisfied. <laughs> what we think maybe happened here was that they didn't actually have air potato. They probably had wing yam or something, but you, you can't please everybody. But we were very, very excited about how successful and um, impactful this program was. So we tried to use this as a model for other weed uh, species, other biological control programs. And so we have started this with the Brazilian pepper tree program. Uh, Brazilian pepper tree is a little bit of a different beast as, as well as the agent. So uh, here, Brazilian pepper tree is clobber Florida. It's kind of sprinkled throughout uh, the rest of the Southeast, but we have been seeing this weed uh, expanding its range. So we definitely think it's going to be problematic in, in more states than just Florida. It is already problematic in California and Hawaii. 
Um, the agent, on the other hand, this uh, the Thrips is not quite as charismatic as the uh, the Beatles are, but you, you got to deal with the hand you're dealt. And so <laughs> we're taking these guys out and and doing a very similar program to uh, to the Air Potato program. Uh, this is brand new. The release permits for this insect were issued back in July 2019, and then of course uh, in early 2020 the world shut down. So that definitely was a little bit of a hiccup, but we um, rushed it off and really got this program kind of started in, in 2021. So it's it's a very uh, new program, but uh, we're moving forward and we're hoping it's going to be as impactful as, as the Air Potato program. Um, there are some challenges with this. Uh, one, it's not a very charismatic insect, and so it doesn't really um, lend itself well to things like temporary tattoos and fun things to get people excited about it. We also need many more insects needed for establishment. So in order to get a uh, established population or establishment in an area, you have to release at least 2,000 insects. And so that has greatly uh, increased the mass rearing aspect of, of these insects. And so um, a little, a little more difficult than the, uh, than the air potato beetles. Uh, the same three labs that were working on the air potato program have started working on this program as well. So we're lucky to have consistent partners, but we have uh, increased our rearing cap capabilities uh, drastically. So this is a number of thrips released from 2019 when we were issued the release permits so at 57,000. And then we are uh, over a million at this point in 2021. So we don't have the last quarter's uh, releases in there yet, but uh, so we're well over a million. So definitely increasing our, our um, releases. Uh, we haven't quite gotten into every county yet, but we are definitely moving in that direction. So this is uh, the counties in blue are the counties where we have released these uh, thrips out on the landscape. And this paper just came out um, just a few uh, a month or so ago about uh, these things uh, persisting in the environment. So we're not quite ready to say they're established, but we're definitely moving in that direction. We're seeing these things persisting in the environment, spreading a little on their own. Um, some very interesting things with the hurricanes that uh, have come through in the last several months. So uh, stay tuned on on those things uh, to see if this is, program is going to be as um, impactful as well received as the Air Potato program was. Uh, acknowledgements, of course, funding agencies, uh, super important. Uh, also, people who have been involved with the program. Um, from from the start, uh, this does not even, these are just the people like the PIs. You, I can't even tell you how many different technicians and lab staff have gone into to these things. So I, for fear of leaving one of them out, just a big thank you to them. Um, but yeah, thanks for uh, listening to, to what we're doing in the Southeast as far as getting these things out there. Great, thanks, Carrie. Those were great examples of successful programs engaging on the ground land managers. You know, I don't have any questions specific to those programs, but there is a general question that somebody asked that I think would be appropriate to pose to you. So it is, um, they're hoping to hear from experts about the role that chemical or mechanical control can play while trying to establish or having already established biocontrol agents, how do you avoid negatively impacting the insects when utilizing other controls like chemical and mechanical? The excellent question. So uh, typically when at the early stages of a program, we ask people to halt any other control, um, control methods going on because we don't know yet, right? Like we don't know how fire or cutting or uh, herbicides will, impact the agents and you know a dead agent doesn't feed doesn't reproduce and so um, we ask that they that they don't do anything um, however the labs also work on um, trying to figure out those best ways of integrating um, biocontrol with uh, with the other methods and once we have the answers to those questions then we of course revise you know what we're, what we tell people and so um we are very pro integrated management, but until we know, and you know, but we're putting these insects out on the landscape, you don't know until you yeah. start to do the studies. Yeah, so I think it's pretty specific from 
biocontrol agent and target weeds from one to another. Yep, most definitely. All right, well, thank you so much, Carrie. So now we will move into our second presentation from the Southeast region of the United States. And that is Melissa Smith with USDA Agricultural Research Service. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's really exciting. Thank you, Carrie, for kicking us off. Um, I am going to go through our basically card catalog of biological control agents, who's out, who's in the pipeline, and uh, some other just wild cards that might be in the system. So um, first off, Carrie did a really nice job of let me see if I can. Oh, okay. Of uh, pointing out the two big labs that are doing research here in Florida. I also want to include Rodrigo Diaz, who's in um, LSU Baton Rouge, uh, as well in Baton Rouge is Veronica Manrique, who happens to be married to Rodrigo, and she's at Southern University, also in Baton Rouge. And then um, Nate Harms over in Vicksburg with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are all doing research on, specifically on biological control of various systems. So, and we all like each other and talk to each other. So we all work together. It's a great system. Um, the first is I will just piggyback on to Carrie and talk about um, programs with uh, approved agents. And the first up is Air Potato. Uh, Carrie did a lovely job uh, laying the groundwork for Lilia Saris Chennai, which was the air potato leaf beetle. Uh, this last year in 2020, we also got approved the air potato bulbul feeder. So we got a one-two punch coming out for air potato. It's going to be gone. Um, it, it, it likely won't be gone, gone, but in all seriousness, the Lilia Saris Chennai beetle, uh, going along with what Carrie said, has really high satisfaction from the public, and that is because it is highly impactful. It reduces leaves, um, or leaf area climbing ability and bulbul mass and production. So we have fewer bulbuls and they are much, much smaller when the Liliaceris chennai is there. However, this beetle is very sensitive to any type of insecticide, especially mosquito control tactics. So an internal feeder that attacks the bulbuls is quite helpful in urban settings where we've had a really hard time. So Alan Dre is working on that. And so far we've got establishment in Miami-Dade County, which is really exciting. And I didn't post two of the exact same beetles the beetle on the lower left is the um, Liliaceris aegina, which is the one that was just approved. And then Liliaceris chennai is up there. They are um, co-occurring in the native range and we find them frequently. So um, we have another thing to point out is that we have no accumulation of parasitoids in Liliaceris chennai, which is very interesting seeing as how it's been out for all 10 years now. So we've uh, done extensive surveys and only found one tachinid, which is pretty exciting. And then we also have wide establishment in the northern range uh, from the Nepalese genotype. So very exciting results on this. If every biological control campaign could be this successful, um, we'd all be paid a million dollars. Next up, old world climbing fern, Ligonium microfilum. Uh, this is the insidious beast of the Southwest or Southeast rather. Uh, it produces by fertile spores that are aerially born. And so they can go anywhere, including the middle of the Everglades, which is where this, this shot was taken. Uh, the approved agents that are out and established include an areophyte mite, Floricaris parapy, um, it is from the Iron Range in Northern Queensland. We've released, a, a, I feel like 15 million is actually a low number, seeing as how we just released 8 million, my technician told me, last month. So many. Um, it's well established. And the very exciting part is, uh, I think I saw Ian Jones in the chat. Uh, Aaron David is around too and Ellen Lake. All of the work that they've done in the last several years has pointed to actually quite a bit of impact from this particular agent. It might be small, but it's mighty. I stole that from Ellen. Sorry, bad joke. Um, the other agent that's out is a crambid moth, Neomusitima conspurcatalis. comes from the same place of the Iron Range in Queensland. Uh, we've released several million as well. Uh, it is well established. We do occasionally see very large uh, outbreaks associated with herbivory of this moth, but we're still skeptical about its long-term impacts. We haven't really seen sustained impact from this particular agent. So um, more on Ligonium microfilm later. 
water hyacinth. Um, so the world's worst weed, I think it's still considered. Uh, it has been the target of biological control since the early 1970s. There are four agents that have been released and three are widely established with a fourth moth that's out there, but not um, terribly prevalent. All of the agents have pretty in, uh, large impact on biomass and flowering. So biomass is reduced by 75%, flowering is reduced by more than 90%. And tagging along with some of the questions that were offered to carry, um, this is a target for integrated pest management te techniques. So integrating herbicide in particular with these biocontrol agents. Uh, the two primary biological control agents that exert the most um, uh, control over these are the neocatina weevils, so neocatina bruchi and neocatina icorni, um, the chevroned and spotted um, uh, water hyacinth weevils. So um, you basically have to uh, yeah, I, I can't tell them apart in the field. They have to be dry and and I have to have an eye loop. Um, so basically we just all, all clamp them together, but they are very impactful. However, they feed internally. And so when they go down, uh, when it gets sprayed, these guys also die with the water hyacinth, which is why we brought in this plant hopper, Megamella scutellaris. It was released in 2012 um, in, in contrast to the neocatina weevils, which were released in the late 1970s. And because of its ability to hop from plant to plant when it gets sprayed, it was the uh, it was targeted specifically for use with integrated pest management. It is established and established widely, so we do find it out in in the environment, but not at high enough densities in order to really be impactful yet. So this was the project of a mass rearing and release campaign, but we never really got despite millions being released, we never really got the densities we wanted. So um, more on new developments later. Uh, I do want to also um, point out that there is another moth that is out there, um, but I don't see it very frequently. And occasionally you find it on the edge, but it's not, it's not uh, in high density. Carrie just mentioned the Brazilian pepper thrips. We have uh, more than a million released to date. There is still spotty establishment and they're trying to figure out what is happening uh, between soil dynamics and plant dynamics and then herbivore dynamics. Remember, this is all a, an open system. Everything works within the environment. You know, there's the, uh, yeah. Anyway, in order to have good, yummy food, you got to have great soil as well, turns out. Um, however, they are highly damaging to new um, growth as well as seedlings. So this is important. Carrie mentioned about hurricane dynamics. So post-hurricanes, post where we had significant wind damage, we are now seeing really high outbreaks of this particular agent. So um, this is the exciting part about biological control research is that once they're out in the environment, we get to ask all of these fun new ecological questions about uh, impacts and effects and response. So, um, and then I, at the end, will actually put who to contact for all of these various projects. Now, uh, I'm going to piggyback with the regulatory agency and say that it's uh, important. And we have come to NASMA on several occasions asking for their support for biological control agents. And they did write letters of support for the release of these two agents for Chinese tallow. The agent on the left is a flea beetle, Bacasha cholaris, and uh, another agent on the right is Gadartha fusca. And um, Chinese tallow is an invasive tree throughout the entire Southeast. It's its impacts and negative impacts on the environment are well documented. However, there is an impression that it is used uh, exclusively for winter forage by honeybees. Now, there's not a ton of evidence for that. It's very anecdotal, but because there is um, a, a, a large lobbying contingent from the Honeybee Association, um, these two insects, which were Their, uh, release permit because of this pressure from the honeybee association. So the um, 
the we it remains to be seen what will happen with this but uh regulatory folks are weighing the pros and cons of their release and um and any legal action that that might group might take um we do have an approved another approved insect for Melaleuca quinquinervia. This is a midge. It's a pea galling midge that uh, creates pea galls on the leaves of Melaleuca. It's closely related to the tip galling midge, Lophitoplosis trifida, that was released uh, in the early aughts. And uh, it was approved in 2021. Like many other things, it got delayed due to COVID. And um, we are simply re, uh, awaiting identification confirmation from um, from taxonomists before we release. This shouldn't be difficult because the voucher specimens are from the same colony, but it's, again, due diligence before we release. We want to make sure that we are releasing exactly the insect that we have a permit to release. Um, and it is another example of how biological control practitioners will target specific feeding guilds. So this agent in particular works on the leaves, and that's where the other insect that has the highest impact also targets, so Oxyops videosa. However, that insect cannot pupate in wet soils, and Melaleuca likes swamps. So obviously there's some gaps in coverage, which is why we brought this insect in. This will be the last insect for Melaleuca um, so that we, we avoid any interference by overlapping feeding guilds. So um, that stay tuned for uh, that and its establishment. So let's talk about insects under testing and in quarantine. Um, in Ligodium, Neostrombocerus albicomus, which is a sawfly, uh, is still under testing, and that's the highest priority insect for uh, petitioning. It was originally petitioned uh, by Bob Pemberton. However, there were some concerns about toxicity to herbivores. Um, so other sawflies produce, um, produce chemicals that can be toxic to cows, for example. So we did some testing and found that these do not actually produce any of those. Um, and they are host specific. So anticipate this uh, insect getting petitioned soon. It is, however, quite difficult to rear in captivity. So this is a major hurdle that we've been trying to figure out. Currently, we're hand mating individuals. So we cut the head off of a male and hand made that to a female. Otherwise, all we get are all male offspring. So something to be considered. Um, Along with that, we also have another crambid moth in in quarantine. This is Ligomusitima stria. It does complete development on the native North American Ligodium, Ligodium palmatum. However, temperature studies that Paul Pratt started in Ellen Lake finished uh, showed that there is not going to be any over range, overlapping ranges uh, for this moth. So those concerns have been abated based on those temperature studies. And a tag petition is in preparation behind the sawfly and Greg Wheeler is currently working on that. And then finally, uh, when we were in Asia and Northern Australia, we saw a lot of this particular uh, noctuid moth. This is Calopistria exotica. Uh, we found it uh, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and then also in the Iron Range in Queensland. And finally, we're able to collect enough of them to get a colony started. They are highly defoliating. They create what's called like a fishbone. So they eat all of the leaflets off of a, off of a ramet on the leaf. And, um, and so they can, they can go through quite a bit of material. However, they may be susceptible to parasitism. They are highly parasitized in the native range. And in Florida, we have a species of Calopistria that is also highly parasitized. So there are concerns about whether or not our native parasitoids could utilize this. However, an interesting bit is that it develops equally well on Ligodium microfilum and Ligodium japonicum. So could be uh, really helpful and beneficial. Hi, Melissa, I'm almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this is the project that Carrie Matir and I are working on, Elyphacacia. We have a 
Um, leaf beetle, calomela intamorata should be very impactful. Bonus, it's cute. So that should be great. And along with it is this other very cute little galling wasp, which should be also very impactful. So we're excited about this one. We're um, just starting host range testing on this and um, concluding host range testing on calomela. So those are the galls and they're beautiful and spectacular. And that's the impacts so far. Um, there are some other projects. Azola panata is being worked on. We are looking for one more final insect with uh, water hyacinth in Argentina. So getting Thryptochus and colony there uh, for something that's more temperature tolerant. Somebody asked about Kogan grass. Greg Wheeler and Matt Purcell are doing foreign surveys and establishing some cooperative agreements with folks in Africa and Asia for looking at these and doing uh, invasion reconstruction for it. And then uh, I did want to mention Rodrigo's work with giant salvinia and redistributing Certabagus. So, um, and, and Nate Harms' work on uh, alligator weed and figuring out temperature tolerant uh, genotypes of the flea beetle. So with that, these are the folks to contact. I included their emails and uh, we look forward to talking with anybody. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was a great presentation and a ton of information. There are a few questions for you in the Q&A box, but I will go ahead and you don't those. have time. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, now we are going to move into the Northeast and Midwest regions of the United States. And our first presenter for this region is Bernd Blossy with Cornell University. All right, I will manage. Okay, uh, this obviously is that okay, Melissa? Can it you give is, me a? It um, is not in presenter view. What? <laughs> so if you click on slideshow, the slideshow button, I think it should. Yeah, I'm just, I just change it. This should okay. be okay now. It looks perfect. Okay. Take it away. All right. So um, I had the uh, fortunate thing to be uh, around Sorry, as to a interrupt, grad... but it um, actually just switched and now we're seeing your your notes page with the slide instead of just the slide. What the hell? <laughs> Let me go back. What are you seeing now? Um, it's like halfway between, there you go. Oh, but it's cut off, actually. We're not seeing the entire, maybe that's just mine. Let me see. Yeah, nope, it's not showing the whole slide. <laughs> okay. How about now? Same. Oh, somebody said it's working for them. So maybe it has something to do with on my end. Jen, Elizabeth, how does it look for you all? It, it looks like it's zoomed in and so we're cutting off the right side and the bottom of the slide. So maybe escape out and try to <clears throat> reshare. Okay, that's a new <laughs> one for me. This is a new okay. one, yes. <laughs> okay, so do a new share. Yeah, maybe zoom. Can you zoom your screen out? Because that also, like in this view, is also cut off. I have no idea what that means. Control zoom Mac. out. Control. Remember, I'm working on a Mac. Oh. <laughs> so how does that look? Oh, you made it a little bit better, but it's still not all the way there. So I don't know what you did, but it did. Oh, that. Um, so we're still, so it's in the notes view still, but we do see the whole slide and the notes are cut off. So how Raise about if I command plus the minus sign for a map. So this is to swap the display because I'm working on an 
on a monitor and a computer, do you see that better now or is it still cut off? Well, we see the entire slide, but we're also seeing the notes part cut off. I mean, if you're okay with it going this way, I think I, that would be I have fine. no notes other than the slides that are coming up. So to to just to just save some of the time and not fussing around anymore, let's just go through that. So I think it's I'm sorry. perfect. Yes. I'm I'm sorry about that, but um, so I had the good fortune to be around as a graduate student when um, this project started in the place where Phil worked. It looked a little different, Phil, at the time when I was there. Um, so that was in Cabby, Switzerland. But we implemented a biocontrol program for purple loose drive. Um, but before I get into that one, I wanted to just remind everybody, uh, if I can advance these slides. Um, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, because I haven't heard much in terms of evidence collection, other things, a little bit from the bison range about why we're doing what we're doing, we care about and want to protect native species. We're not here to just uh, limit distributions and abundance of introduced species. This is what we would like to protect different species in different in different areas and we manage introduced species whether these are plants that we're talking about today or other things um, because we want to reduce their harmful logical and economic impacts we do not manage them because they're new immigrants it's really really important to not forget that you will not hear the word weeds come out of my uh, my mouth or invasive alien species. Words matter in the contact that we uh, uh, portray with that matter, not just for us, but for other people that we need uh, uh, our support or <laughs> we need their support. So just a reminder of that. Um, here's a little bit of a timeline of the Purple Loose Drive Biocontrol Program. Um, Sorry, Burned, the your slides aren't advancing. So we're still just seeing that intro slide. If you push the arrows um, underneath. I did. Mine are advancing just fine. So I have no idea where the hang up is right now. Elizabeth, do you have any technical advice? So, no, I'm a little bummed on this one, but um, can you go up to the top left and I see a button that says use slideshow. Can you click on that for us? Um, it says end show tips, swap displays, and use slideshow. So I just displayed the. Um... Oh, there we go. There we go. Got it. And it looks great. That's perfect. Huh. Yep. That's a very new one for me. So I pr I did not do the, pra the practice session, but this has never happened to me. And I don't know, 100 or 200 presentations that I have given. Okay, so um, uh, I just leave it as that. So you see now the slide with loose draft in the left-hand corner and the timeline title. Yeah, that's what you see in? Yes, it looks okay, great. perfect. Sorry, sorry so much about that. So uh, I will speed up a little bit, but try to slow down the message. Um, so this is the timeline. Work started in 85, um, overseas kind of ended in 94, releases were made starting in 1992 of two leaf beetles, they all look the same, uh, a root feeder like this one, this is what happens to the roots, and then a flower feeder in 94. We developed a monitoring protocol, taught people how to do it. Uh, declines were reported very quickly, initially in Canada and then all through yes. Uh, mass productions were done to allow uh, uh, folks to get hands on root feeders and leaf uh, feeders all through the area. Long-term uh, monitoring sites were established. And then uh, we did a program evaluation, a long-term program evaluation starting in 19 uh, or 20, 2019. So just to get a little uh, bit of a status update, some of you may see the t-shirt that I'm wearing, right? So we, this was done and there was a lot of focus on bringing the message out. We heard a lot about that. There are books about that, studies, uh, 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 keys for students in high school or so, but releases were initially made across North America. I uh, coordinated that initially together with Luke Skinner from the Minnesota DNR when he was still working there. We made a monitoring protocol available, but then the responsibilities for following up to implement, fund, and assess what was happening actually switched to states and provincial uh, uh, responsibilities and agencies. Um, so what we now know is very little, actually. 
uh, in terms of the accessible literature of long-term outcomes, there's a few studies from uh, from Michigan and Indiana and some other things. Um, but what I know is because I know people started that, the file drawer is full of, unfortunately, mostly forgotten local success stories. Um, the attention has mostly shifted to other targets. Um, and uh, But you can find on the web before and after pictures, they're archived and people will tell stories about it, but that's not gonna be good enough. Uh, so we keep on forgetting what was there at some point. Uh, and some uh, 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 work that Rachel Winston is putting together, we now know these are the current reported distributions of the organisms in North America. They're totally unreliable, they're not correct, and they're at the uh, um, at the state or provincial uh, level. Um, I know that the insects are in Nebraska, and, yeah, at least some of them, but this is at least what we have as knowledge that can be documented, right? So it's not complete. You see that the leaf beetles are the most widely distributed one, the root feeder, because it's hidden and night active and living in the roots, we know very little about. Uh, and we know a little bit more about the uh, flower feeders and anophias. Uh, we have before and after pictures, right? But here it's actually before loose dry at the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and then three years later, after loose drive came in big time. And can we reverse that? Here's a before and after picture from Tonawanda. These are all locations in New York that I will be talking about. These were the cages that were built for the first releases of the leaf feeders and root feeders at the Tonawanda Wildlife Management Area. And eight years later, it looked a little bit like Montezuma looked like. Of course, these are uh, lame comparison, but at least some visual things we can take from that and say, ah, maybe this will work. Um, but we were fortunate enough being funded uh, through uh, a various small grants by the New York Department of Environment Conservation to do some stuff uh, uh, to assess what the long-term outcomes are. We had intermittent funding, including from the uh, Nature Conservancy, and we have these long-term monitoring locations stretched throughout New York. Uh, this is the border to Canada here, and you can kind of see these these stars um, where our long-term monitoring sites are clustered. There's a total of 32 sites that we have. Basically, the monitoring um, happened in one meter quadrats. That was um, uh, uh, one meter square quadrats. That was the recommendation that came out of the monitoring protocol. Uh, we recorded stem densities, heights, flowering for purple loose strife, insect abundance using time counts, and then Victoria Nuzu did the vegetation assessment. And in 2019, we did a halobius check because we didn't want it to interfere um, with population built up by digging up roots and then destroying things in our monitoring locations. So uh, a couple of before and after pictures. Again, what you can find is, you know, the top is before. Um, this is maybe 10 years later in areas in Eastern Lake Ontario wetlands, the typical things that we all see. Loose drive sometimes very big when we started, then becoming small. And please note the small flowering clusters here, much less reduced seed output. Wonderful, we like to see that. This is what the wetlands look like. This is Victoria Nuzu in a beautiful stand that still has quite a bit of loose drive in it, but it looks beautiful as a wetland should be looking like. And uh, purple loose drive is a component of it all. Um, and here are some of the dramatic pictures that uh, you have seen. This was Tonawanda. I'm sorry, this was the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge in 1992. And this is what it looks like. There's no loose drift to be found uh, in, in this area, even if you look, but it's all cattail. Is that good or is it bad? Um, well, that's uh, in the eye of the species that make use of it. This is Tonawanda. Uh, the suppression has may, been maintained, but it's still there. But we also have locations. This is in the Hudson River Valley, and I will be talking a little bit about it, where we still find pockets of loose drive, particularly along roadside or in shaded sites. So loose drive has not disappeared from the landscape. It's still there. Uh, but what we also documented through our work was that purple loose drive was the bully in the system. Um, and by reducing the competitive ability of purple loose drive and reducing stem densities and other things, we now favor the cover of native plant species. This is native plant species only. As we're reducing stem densities that at some point were over 100 per meter square down to less than, uh, you know, maybe 25 or 20 or so, native plant species can thrive in that. 
it's a message that other people have uh, said during the session as well. We do not need eradication. Native plant species will do just fine with some presence of purple loosestrife. They can happily, I don't know whether it's happy, coexist with loosestrife, no eradication uh, necessary. Please, for purple loosestrife, that's the only thing that I can say, do not attempt to eradicate. These small populations are stepping stones for dispersal of biocontrol agents. The lack of suppression is particularly strong when populations are managed, mowed or sprayed. It backfires, particularly along highways and frequent disturbances. Shady slides are slower to respond, but the root feeder is right in them and it takes longer for them to be controlled. There are no non-target effects. Particular species, native lithrums and decadon, were thought of that they could be attacked. Indeed, they were occasionally attacked, but their populations are thriving and returning um, in, in our areas. Here is some of the science behind it. It takes time. Patience is really required. We have heard that before. Here is quantitative evidence. We're working on additional papers that will document that. And uh, my co-authors are Stacey Andrews and Victoria Nuzo, as I've said before. Patience is required, but it pays off. You will not get the payoff if you interfere. Biocontrol is successful because it's slow. Native species can respond. They cannot immediately respond if you spray uh, the ones that come back after a complete kill of loose or So will be the ones that are sitting in the seed bank, very often other introduced species. Here's the number of purple loose strife stems, time in years over the beginning density. Uh, that's all the change. It takes 10, 15 years for something to become uh, uh, significant. This is the stem density. These are the native plant species. After 15 years, we finally get to a point where the native plant species are responding strongly and uh, taking over. It's the same for all plant species. If I summarize all that data, is what we find is the largest populations are reduced to almost nothing. Uh, no longer a management issue. So please stop interfering. Uh, roadside shaded areas show persistent populations, but they are not ecologically important for us because that's not where the biodiversity uh, uh, is. Heavy defoliation is happening with late summer. So what you see here is defoliated leaves, early growth, and then loose turf recovers because the insects go, particularly the leaf beetles that do a lot of these defoliations, they go and overwinter by August. So we have greatly reduced stature. Uh, but uh, and, and flowering. It's no longer an ecological problem. We do have local eradication at a meter square level or others, but typically these uh, uh, stands hang in there. Um, I'm getting there, Melissa. <laughs> you just popped up on the middle of my screen. Uh, there are any fluctuations, as I said, uh, uh, there are no non-target implants that are at least not affected. If you interfere, you're creating a biocontrol graveyard. And whether that's mowing or whether that's digging, I know the emphasis is on trying to prevent uh, negative impacts. You're interfering with it uh, needlessly. Um, these are stepping stones, basically charging stations for biocontrol agents. Eradication is not a useful goal. And even late season mosquito control is detrimental. So do not do that. Uh, if we want to protect and improve local habitats in the light of native species, Make sure yes, whether that is true and whatever is done. Force yourself and others to be patient. Do not rush to judgment or action. Does short-term suppression really result in long-term improvements? Document that. Collect local evidence. Do not rely on gut feeling or mantras. The presence of an introduced plant is not the problem. Local dominance is. And this is important for me. I do no longer accept affirmations that managers are too busy to treat uh, and don't have time to collect data. You need to do that. If you want to do something with loose turf and you're uncertain what the status is in your areas, because I wasn't out monitoring across North America, check in the spring if leaf beetles are present. You will find them. Isolated purple loose turf populations may need to be restocked. Um, that's a potential that I can see. Consider the root feeder and flower feeder if you still want to target purple loose turf and stop trying to integrate with herbicide or other management options. It backfires and in particular stresses native plants. Uh, this is the pretty pictures uh, that you can have. It takes 15, 20 more years to go from a loose strife dominated situation to one that's ecologically valuable uh, and wonderful. Take time, do not interfere because you push the uh, project back. Biocontrol is successful because it is slow. Allow it to happen. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. There was some great advice for everybody in there that I think works across many biocontrol systems. So next we are going to hear from <coughs> Rob Boucher, who's actually based out of Canada, but he has some updates for species that are also appropriate for the Northeast and the Midwest. So um, Rob, also I want you to know you get your full 15 minutes, even though we're a little bit over time, we'll just cut into that break. So no need to rush through. And your slides okay. look great, so take it away. Okay, great, thanks Melissa. Okay, so with apologies to the Raptors, uh, we're now going to talk about the North um, biocontrol implementation in Canada. And um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors here with Ag Canada and colleague co-authors at University of Toronto. Mm, let's go page down. This will work. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about implementation in Canada go through the stages that we go through in the biocontrol program and the things we're targeting, and then give you a little bit of an update of uh, the status of some new weed biocontrol agents in Canada. There's a long history of implementing biocontrol in Canada as evidenced by these volumes here. These are the books with CABI that start in 1910, uh, initially focused mostly on agriculture and forestry. Uh, weeds didn't come into it until 1951 with the first uh, target being St. John's wort. And since that time, there's been 86 foreign insects released against uh, 34 different weeds. Uh, this is the uh, breakdown of the, those uh, agents across the country. Um, uh, this was originally done by Alec McClay in 2002, and it's just been updated. I updated it to 2022. But you can see there's a Heavy prevalence of uh, agents in the West, reflecting the predominance of rangeland, a lot of weeds there. It tails off a little bit as you go to the East, but uh, releases in all provinces except Newfoundland. Uh, this is the process that we go through in implementing. It's a seven step thing. Um, there's others that have broken it down into these four steps on the, the left. Uh, but the, to begin with, the first question is uh, understanding the species interactions. Um, what sort of impact or interaction that the target weed is having? Is it justified to do a biocontrol pro program? Once that's been decided, then overseas exploration in the country of origin. Um, then we uh, move into, and this is all where the federal research really kicks in, moving uh, through those stages. Uh, the biology and the host range studies to make sure that the agent might be safe. Uh, assuming that it is, a petition goes in from the agent release. This is followed by work on rearing uh, and field release. Rearing, how do you produce enough of them to get them out there? Um, do you need diet? Do you need plants? What sort of things do you need to do? Field release, um, how many to put out, where to put them out, uh, whether it's better in a cage or out of a cage, that sort of thing. And then once you get establishment, you move to understanding uh, why they've established and the impact that they might be having. And finally, it's not until you get to stage seven where you really talk about implementation, which I think is the way we're thinking about it in this, in this meeting, in terms of redistribution, uh, getting them out there for, for use in integrated weed management. And that's often in Canada and elsewhere, I'm sure, shared regionally with the provinces, stakeholders, and land managers. So the, the federal research program sort of drives it through to that point, and then it's picked up by other groups uh, to bring it home. So speaking specifically about that implementation in Canada, if you're trying to get agents, the availability of agents is really pro provincially province dependent. Um, there's a lot of groups involved, provincial municipal governments, First Nations, producer environmental organizations like Ducks Unlimited, Nature Conservancy, transportation and energy companies, CP Rail, uh, gas uh, pipeline companies, that sort of thing where uh, initially the work that's done would be in short-term propagation to get lots of the agents available, and that can often happen at nurse sites. Um, provincially, BC has the most comprehensive program, which is administered by the BC Ministry of Forests. Dave uh, is going to talk about that a little bit later about a specific project with knapweed taking it through the process. In Alberta, there's the Alberta Invasive Species Council, which runs the operational program that was started by Ag Canada. Uh, they're now running it. And then in Ontario, the availability is species specific. Uh, Silvacon, a company uh, in Ontario, is producing the agent for dog strangling vine. 
And we're working with Ducks Unlimited to get the agents for Phragmites available. But basically, if you're in Canada looking for agents, um, the simplest thing is to contact somebody in Ag Canada uh, who, if you're not in one of those provinces, and, and if the agents are available, we can direct you to them. Unfortunately, they often uh, aren't in terms of like that we can just pick them off the shelf and make them available. So moving on to what we're targeting in the agents, this is a big, ugly table, but all I really want you to look at is in this side is the stages that I just went through. This side is the activities that I just talked about, about what we do at each of those stages. And then these are the weeds that we're targeting uh, with these agents here. It's important to note uh, that there might be uh, agents uh, targeting the same weed, but at different stages. So we have a seed feeder here. We have a, a root stem feeder here for garlic mustard. Similarly for toad flax, there's two agents. So we can have agents at any stage in the process uh, moving moving through. So um, somebody, uh, Phil, just talked earlier about some of the agents that had just recently been approved in Canada. So I don't really need to touch much more on those. He gave a better description. So I can jump on and talk about uh, agents that we've recently released um, and what their status is. And I'm just going to go through these four. There's a few that I can't cover, don't have time. So knotweed, um, this is the knotweed psyllid, uh, was first the timeline for that one, uh, collected in uh, 2004 in Kyushu uh, by colleagues with CABI in the UK. Um, there was extensive host range testing on it between 2008 and 2012 to make sure that it was specific. The petition to release it went in in 2012, was approved in Canada in 2014 for release. And then since that time, we've done extensive releases and monitoring, uh, lots of psyllids in Ontario, BC, and Alberta, um, all targeting um, Japanese knotweed. And what we've had is we've had overwintering successfully. We've had multiple generations within a season, but we have not had a consistent population persist at a site that we've been able to detect over multiple seasons. Um, so basically it's not established and that's a problem. Um, so we, in 2016, um, what we did was um, go back to Kyushu and recollect the same population or from the same area. Uh, with the idea that there might have been genetic bottlenecking between 2004 and 2016. Not surprising because it had been rearing for all that time. And then another line was connected to, collected in 2019 from Murakami. And this line uh, was found uh, on Bohemian, not a Bohemian knotweed, if, if they're difficult to identify in Japan, but that's what it's believed to be. Um, and it's... Um, that's the one that most of the work has been done on recently. It, the reason is, is because it looks very promising against Bohemian knotweed and giant knotweed. This was work that's been done in the UK and in Europe, as well as in North America. Um, so in 2000, what it does is it causes this really intensive curling and stunting of the growth of the plant. And um, that's the sort of thing we're looking for. So that's the, the focus of the release program right now. So in 2002, we released 161,000, roughly, targeting, again, Bohemian and giant knotweed in British Columbia. We also did a release uh, releases on Japanese knotweed in Ontario uh, to see if we could get it established, but with the recognition that it does not cause that intensive leaf curling. So it may be that it will only work uh, against Bohemian and giant knotweeds. There were some very encouraging results coming out of the Netherlands in terms of releasing Murakami on uh, Bohemian knotweed in terms of getting persistence and of a population. And that's that's the first step towards getting impact if it's going to happen. However, we may need to go back uh, and do exploration in the native range in Japan for a, a psyllid that can do the same sort of thing to Japanese knotweed. Moving on to Phragmites. Uh, this is a project that began in 1998 uh, with that explore with the initial exploration. Agents were chosen in 2005. There were these two moths. This is one of them here. Uh, host range testing began in 2007 up to 2018 when a petition was submitted in Canada and the U.S. 
the petition was approved for or the insects were approved for release in Canada in 2019. So that's where we are in Canada now. We're at that stage five of trying to figure out how to get these insects established. What's the best way to release them, et cetera. And this is with colleagues, uh, Barron and Cornell, Lisa Tewksbury, Dick Casagrande, and colleagues at CABI. Um, so where are we at with that? Uh, in the last, since 2019, we've been working on protocols to rear the insects. We can rear one of them on artificial diet. Uh, how to release them? Is it better to release them in cut stems like this? There's larvae of the, of the moths that have been planted in those stems, and then we plant the stems out. Or we have a system where we can release uh, eggs either early uh, in the fall and then have them there over the winter or in the spring. It works better in the spring because you know uh, the plants are going to come up. You can put the eggs right where the plants are. You can hard to tell that in the fall. Um, there's been 13 sites where we've released over 17,000 insects. These are the sites in southern Ontario. So New York is here, Pennsylvania is there, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, just for reference to the U.S. folks. Um, and the good news is that when in the first year of releases, when we get the agents out there, we have found damage on two to 39% of the stems at the release point. So the insects are coming out of those uh, stems and moving to the new ones that they need to do. This The moths move through four or five stems in their life, or the larvae of the moths do. Um, and then in year two, so following that, we're finding 75% of the sites had damage away from the release point. So we're only two years into really getting them out there and we're already seeing the insects spread into the patch. So it's very encouraging uh, towards calling this an establishment. We're not there yet. Um, one of the things in this picture here, you can see these is the wilting and damage to the stem. So it's not like you're seeing huge amounts of dead frag. We're nowhere near that, um, but it is evident and visible uh, once you develop the monitoring for it. So moving on to garlic mustard, this uh, this is a root weevil, uh, Pseudorhynchus scrobicolis. This is a stem that uh, has had weevils. This is a plant that has not had weevils. It increases plant mortality, decreases seed production. The first releases we had for this one were in 2018 uh, with colleagues below. Um, where we're at with that one, uh, we have seven sites in Ontario, one site in Alberta. We've been able to release 124 adults with rearing help from CABI and University of Minnesota. Uh, and then we've, we also expose plants to the weevil adults that lay eggs and larvae in them, and then we plant those plants out. This one's quite challenging to find and collect. The folks at CABI are really good at it. We're not so good yet. Um, and it's also a challenging one to rear because it has quite a complex life cycle in terms of moving it around to different conditions. The good news is, is that it doesn't, you don't need a lot of weevils per site um, to get feeding damage and evidence of establishment. Uh, we haven't confirmed that yet, but we're pretty sure that we have populations established. When I say we haven't confirmed it, we haven't recollected uh, weevils and been able to confirm that they are the right species. Uh, but it's looking uh, promising with that. We're hopeful that that will be relatively soon. Okay, this is a fourth one, yellow toad flax, Rhinusa pelosa. Uh, this is work with uh, the Rose Marie de Klerk Floak it's doing out of Lethbridge. Uh, the, the weevil was introduced from Serbia, uh, very host specific and has good impact. It's univolting one generation per year. So the adults emerge in the spring, the eggs are laid on those young shoots. And then these, these ones form a gall in which basically the larvae complete their development and come out as an adult from that gall, and then those adults overwinter again. First releases for this one were 2014 to 2016, all across Canada. There was a big a collaborative team that was involved in this. And this is uh, Rose's results uh, with this one to date. Basically, when it was monitored in 2019, uh, some weevil populations were doing very well. Here we are out in the prairies, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, BC. Um, and you've got some populations where these stars are, uh, where they're increasing fourfold. And this has continued. Uh, there are some amazing sites around Calgary or within Calgary uh, where the populations are just taking off. Um, other sites didn't establish at all. So there's still some variation and Rose has been doing some work to understand what are the factors that may be contributing to that. 
um, but the but the insect is established now in BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So just to sum up, um, we have this research program. We're moving this agent the agents through the seven step process that I that I talked about. I want to highlight what others have said here that biocontrol is slow and it takes a long time. This is the starting date when each of these agents uh, was uh, being um, that the work started. Um, this is the date when we got to finally releasing them. So you know, ten years. Uh, 11 years and so on, uh, some of them 20 years. Um, and then we get to this next point where we're actually at that stage six, where we were able to look at establishing an impact. And Dave's going to talk about one that's been going for 52 years in terms of understanding uh, what's actually going on, on out there in the landscape. Uh, but it, so it is a long process, uh, but with patients, uh, you, you hopefully we get something good in the end. And just to finish up the theme of the meeting, the availability of the agents varies in Canada. If you're in BC, uh, it's talking to the province. If you're in Alberta, there's a group doing it. Other provinces, uh, it's really hit or miss whether or not you can get the agents, but certainly uh, contacting uh, at Canada, we can help direct you to somebody or where there might be sites available to get them. And with that, I'll finish. Uh, oh, I one, whoops. One more slide acknowledging all of the people uh, that there's a huge group involved in this work and certainly critical funding support from a lot of different groups as well. And with that, I would take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. Um, there are a few questions for you in the Q&A box, if you wouldn't mind going in and typing out some answers to those. But I think right now we'll take a quick break. Uh, it's going to be a bit shortened from what it says on the agenda. Um, we will resume at 1225. So four minutes of break. And we'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, everyone, it is 1225. Sorry for such a short break, um, but uh, in thinking about folks who are coming and going, we wanna stay on schedule as much as possible. Um, so our next presenter is Dave Insing um, with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Awesome, thanks, Melissa. Hopefully everyone can hear me, this looks, looks good. Um, it looks and sounds good to me. Fantastic. Um, hi everyone, thank you uh, for having me today and for attending this talk. I didn't realize I was the one presenter with 30 minutes, so hopefully it's worth your time. I'm gonna to speak to you today as Rob kind of suggested earlier on about um, the long-term biological control program for spotted knapweed in Canada. Um, this is gonna get a little bit researchy, um, sort of in contrast to some of the other talks today, um, but hopefully it can kind of highlight how we go about things um, up here and um, how that relates to work down in the States as well. Um, First things first, just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and ceded territory of the Seal Okanagan Nation, and I'm really grateful to be uh, present on their territory. So spotted knapweed, as probably most of you will be aware at this point, um, and, and its congener diffuse knapweed have been a subject of biocontrol efforts for more than 50 years. I'm um, having first colonized North America around Victoria, British Columbia in the late eight, or in the mid 1890s. Um, as kind of burn suggested, um, it's been considered problematic because it causes reductions in forage quality, uh, soil fertility, biodiversity, wildlife habitat. It reduces water infiltration in, in places where it invades, which often results in an increased water runoff and stream sedimentation. Um, and so really, as has been highlighted throughout the um, presentations today, um, the problem with spotted knapweed is its impact on native biodiversity. As such, um, you know, and those those negative impacts, you know, from a human perspective might not sound particularly drastic. Um, they don't directly affect our food products. Um, but when you consider the distribution in southern British Columbia, as indicated by the, the gray points on this map here, and you consider that this sort of distribution extends far beyond the borders of BC um, and, and, and um, uh, the associated states right below, it becomes clear that this is an extremely problematic species. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that. As such, in Canada, uh, millions are spent each year on control efforts. Um, but as this distribution should, should, su should suggest, and reflecting what Carol kicked things off today, traditional chemical and mechanical means are not sufficient um, for controlling uh, this species. So following closely on the heels of, a, of the initial um, St. John's Wort Biological Control Program in the middle of the 19th or, eight or 20th century, um, with imported insect species. Um, a biological control program for both spotted, as I'm going to talk to you today about, and it's very closely related congener diffuse knapweed was initiated. And the first of what are now 13 insect agents was released um, in North America. So I've, I've indicated the timeline here. If, if you're in the States and you're thinking those dates don't quite match up, these are the Canadian uh, release dates. Um, species indicated in brackets on this timeline um, are those that well, either were not never released in Canada um, or did not or are not known to have established. Um, we see a little interesting pattern. We've got seed head feeders um, in this, uh, released initially, uh, followed by several different root boring um, agents, and then again more seed feeding agents um, into the 90s. So over 20 years of different releases, kind of reflecting that long time frames that have been uh, talked about today. Um, as suggested in, the, in this figure, you know, these are split between root feeders, which are targeting um, available resources for growth and reproduction, and seed head feeders, which directly target reproductive output. And that's particularly important in, in knapweeds, as reproduction is exclusively by seed. Um, there's no vegetative reproduction, as there is in some of the other invasives we've talked about today. I mean, at least in diffuse uh, knapweed, um, it has been largely successful um, once the correct agents were introduced. So in this case, the most effective agent is predicted to be Lorinus minutus, um, shown in the photos at the bottom. It was released at, released, uh, at the arrow there in, in 1991 in BC. And within a few generations of the biennial diffuse knapweed, uh, we see strong reductions down to you know, very few stems per meter squared, at least in these um, results from Judy Myers. The response of spotted knapweed, a longer lived perennial, has been slower and, at least in some locations, encouraging, as I'll show you here for sites in Lac Dubois grasslands, which are north of Kamloops in south central BC. For instance, here we have the um, root mining weevil Cyphocleonus acades, a large charismatic 
uh, megafauna, as I like to refer to it, it was featured in several of the other talks today. It was released in the late 80s, as I showed initially. Um, and in this data set, it was confirmed that there were no Cyphocleinus cicadas uh, present in this park area in, in 1999. They were released at four different densities, as indicated by the point colors in the top left, um, and a no release control um, at 25 sites across the Lac du Bois uh, Grasslands Provincial Protected Area. And uh, within a few years, populations rapidly increased. And then following about 10 years, there's basically no difference um, in density of, of SIFO among the sites of different release rates. And correspondingly, we found, a, or there was found a, a very strong decline in spotted knapweed across the park as well. And again, it didn't really matter what the initial release rate was indicating the uh, dispersal capacity um, of these weevils who are apparently lightless, though I'd love to be challenged on that by anyone who has evidence to the contrary. So similarly, this is a site uh, south of Merritt, it's about an hour south of where uh, those sites, those are the results from Kamloops. In 1994, we have a thick patch of spotted knapweed. By 2008, there's very few. And having gone back in 2019, we find that that is also uh, still true. However, other sites, such as, as these two on the right, there's a thick uh, spotted knapweed population still going on. And the, and the provincial ministry, the uh, BC Ministry of Forests, as Rob suggested, it's continued to field calls from stakeholders about um, spotted knapweed and its apparent rebounds. So in contrast uh, to those results from diffuse knapweed I showed you earlier, we have very little quantitative evidence on what's been going on with spotted knapweed through time. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the province is fielding continuous calls from stakeholders who are complaining about uh, spotted knapweed abundance as either never been under control or is rebounding. Um, and this leads to the kind of first objective of, of the research program that I've part of the research program that I'm leading here at Summerland, um, which is basically is spotted knapweed declining. We heard uh, from Carl earlier talking about how you know you're fielding calls from managers who seek um, relatively few plants and are concerned about the about the invasion there. When if they could only remember what it was 30 years ago, uh, they would be very happy to see just a few. So that's one question that we had. If is biocontrol responsible for any declines we may or may not observe? And if not everywhere, why? So the first thing we do is just uh, get a handle on what's going on out there. So we identified um, with huge contributions from the BC Ministry of Forests and lots of uh, digging through file drawers, as, as Bern was mentioning earlier, uh, for existing data, looking for any kind of data that might have an indication on uh, spotted knapweed densities. And this included sort of range assessments. It, can, it concluded um, information directly sourced from invasive plant monitoring. But the vast majority of it was just from, you know, haphazard plant community uh, sampling that, that we, we dug up. So we identified 58 sites, as indicated by the red points here, um, that have some um, monitoring of plant density uh, for spotted knapweed through time. There's a very strong concentration of them around the Kamloops um, office of the BC Ministry of Forests up here. Um, and as I was kind of suggesting, this, this was a bit, pretty big endeavor. We received basically scanned copies of field data sheets um, that uh, an army of undergraduate students spent hours entering into um, useful format. So big, big thanks to them here. Of those 58 sites, we identified 23 that seemed suitable to both um, kind of capture the diversity of, of um, environment that spotted knapweed was in, but also maintaining like a manageable sample size um, for field work. And these are also sites that had at, at least um, three previous visits that um, documented spotted knapweed density. So you can see they're spread across the landscape in BC and include uh, three sites in that really thick cluster uh, near near Kamloops, um, which is those Lac du Bois sites I showed you some data for earlier. At all 23 of those sites, uh, we ran linear transects, um, usually matching up with previous surveys. So there'll be old rebar uh, pegs staked into the ground uh, that have been there for 20 or 30 years. Um, and we went back out and checked them. Uh, this is Lac du Bois grasslands near Kamloops. Um, along those tapes, we uh, sampled both bolt and rosette density in half meter square quadrats. We dug up 30 plants to um, uh, check for control agent presence. Um, this is done, as you can see, maybe maybe detected by this photo here. It was done in the fall, um, and so that means we're actually able to get a pretty good hand on handle on what's going on in the seed heads. Um, but the roots were usually just seeing sort of empty chambers for main agents that might have been there. And at each of the sites, we installed temperature and relative humidity loggers, which are recording 
um, those, those features hourly. So let's get into some results right away here. So the first thing I've got here is we've got time on the x-axis and years. On the y, we've got bolts per meter squared of spotted NAPWE density through time. It's gonna get gonna look a little messy, um, but basically all the different colors are different sites and they're not particularly important here. Uh, the black is the annual mean. And as you can see, it varies quite a bit among years. If we log scale that y-axis and, and fit a, a mixed model to it, we find that we get a relatively good fit um, here where when controlling for site, we find a, um, a quadratic decline in spotted knapweed abundance over the sort of 30 years for which we have reasonably good data on knapweed density. Um, um, this is bold density, so um, on reproductive structures. But so we want to know what's going on there. We find a bit of, we find a decline, but what's going on there? So the next step here was to um, do some plant dissections uh, at each of those sites. As I said, we collected 30 individuals, both in 2019 and then again um, in 2021. Um, take those back to the lab, uh, break them out of the freezer and dissect them. Occasionally we find little agents in like this agapetta, which I think Carl mentioned earlier, um, a root mining moth, um, measure a whole bunch of morphological traits and, and also dissect seed heads and quantify uh, seed production. As I said, it is required uh, for, for reproduction of the species and meant to identify the control agents inside the seed heads. So the first thing to note here across our sites, and they're not really ordered by anything um, here, so, so don't worry about that right now, but is that seed production is highly variable both uh, among and within sites. We see some sites like this cold water site, which is actually featured in the photos off the, off the top, um, where seed production is on average basically zero. Um, and others uh, where there's you know, huge variation, hundreds and hundreds of seeds per individual, um, all the way down to zero. Um, I'm calling this seed rain here, but basically this is the product of the um, mean seeds produced per plant times the bolt density on those sites. And so we're seeing here that the seed production, I guess, is um, highly variable again, ranging from almost zero to several thousand seeds. Note the, the log scale on the y-axis here. But what's particularly interesting here um, is that a life table study from a PhD thesis in the early 80s suggested that sort of seed production below 1500 seeds per meter squared, which would be indicated by the dashed line near the top here, would be enough for population decline in, in spotted knapweed. If that is true, all sites for which we have measured or quantified these, these features um, should be in longer term population decline as they fall below that line. Uh, it does seem like a rather high value to me. A second source, uh, this is from Jim Story in Montana, um, found that when quantifying seed bank, 160 seeds per meter squared in a seed bank, anything below that uh, would start leading to long-term uh, population decline as well. If that holds here, and again, we're talking about seed production, not just what's in, not what's in the seed bank, nine of our 22 sites are falling below that threshold in, threshold in seed rain alone. And so we're thinking that these are somewhat positive results, but as has been highlighted throughout the, the talks today, there's a little bit of an issue here with time. We do need to consider how long um, it might take for this to lead to long-term population decline. Okay, so now we wanna know is, is that as a result of um, biological control agents? So as I said, we dissected all those uh, plants. I've got six, showing data from 650 different plants here. Um, representing 21 of the 23 study sites. Um, that dropped a little bit because one of the sites had, two of the sites had no plants at all. So in this map, the pies here represent the relative frequency of attack within each site, where yellow is individuals with seed head agents only, red is root agents only, and blue is both. Um, gray represents plants with no evidence attack. Um, the main thing to take home here uh, first is that there's not really any predictable variation in who's attacking um, plants in space. The second is that nearly all plants are um, experiencing attack by biological control agents. In fact, more than 95% of dissected plants have been attacked by seed head feeding agents, and 67% 67 are, 67 are attacked by both seed head and root feeding agents. So we're getting a ton of attack, and nearly all plants are being attacked by those that uh, target their reproductive output. This is particularly encouraging, as I keep saying, uh, this, this is a self incompatible self-incompatible species that can only reproduce uh, through seed. Um, indeed, Lorinus minutus, Lorinus minutus um, seed head feeding weevil, um, which, which is attributed for the declines in, in diffuse knapweed, um, is present in nearly um, 
in over 30% of the heads we dissected. So we've seen relatively strong uh, declines in spotted knapweed abundance in, um, across our study sites, and this corresponds with heavy seed predation. And in some cases, this seed predation re reduces site level seed production um, below a proposed lower limit for self-sustaining populations. So why do we see diffuse being largely controlled? Um, so in addition, um, in addition to uh, Judy's data shown on, on the left, um, you know, as a kid growing up in this piece of this little finger of the Great Basin up here in, in uh, the Okanagan Valley of BC, I used to battle with spotted knapweed everywhere when I was out uh, playing in the rangeland. And I find that's not nearly the case now. There's much fewer, far fewer, um, much lower abundance, I should say, of, of diffuse knapweed. So what's going on? We see we get a reduction from about uh, 10 stems per meter squared down to you know almost zero. Whereas for spotted knapweed showing here on the right, we're going from very high density of stems in the 90s, you know, on the order of 40 to 50, down to maybe about 10 stems per meter squared. What's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things going on. These two species differ markedly in their life histories. Uh, diffuse is a short-lived uh, diploid or winter annual, depending on the case, but it in any case, it only reproduces once um, in its lifetime. Spotted knapweed is a much longer lived tetraploy. The consensus seems to be now that all the invaded, uh, invasive spotted knapweed populations in North America, at least on, in the Western North America, are tetraploids. They have a lifespan, um, it's been estimated up to 15 years. And in addition to being able to reduce multiple times, including in their very first year of growth, they often produce multiple bolts uh, per taproot, so the seed production is going to be considerably larger. This fits. Um, polyploids are often larger than their diploid cousins. Um, they're often more phenotypically plastic, um, and as a result, produce many more uh, progeny. Additionally, polyploidy is known to enhance available genetic diversity available for selection in novel environments. You have duplicate copies of each gene, then those um, can uh, kind of drift uh, somewhat randomly and generate new phenotypes. And in the case of um, spotted knapweed, as I said, uh, they seem to be all, all tetraploids, whereas in Europe, there are kind of mixes of diploid and tetraploid uh, spotted uh, knapweed, and the diploids there are short-lived, much like the diffuse we see here. So practically, this results in increased size, lifespan, and consequently lifetime fitness. And taken together, this will slow the rate at which seed head feeding agents can bring a species under control. As such, it is not reasonable to expect uh, control spotted to follow the time frames um, of diffuse snapweed. So, given I keep highlighting the the what's going on in the in the seed heads, I wanted to uh, just show you a little bit about what we find when we look at the um, relative abundance of different species um, in the seed heads. Um, so, the different colors here on these so the same pies as you saw before. Um, in this case, the colors represent the identity of different control agents, um, noting that we haven't separated between the two uh, Lorinus species, as that's difficult without um, having adults or doing barcoding of larvae. Um, but what you see here is that, again, as I said earlier, Lorinus shows up in all of them, so it's the light blue color, or in the case of of these purple bars, it's most often, these are um, heads with two different agent species in it, often that's Lorinus and Europhora affinis, so light blue and the dark red, um, hence we selected the purple color for that. Um, and very, very, very rarely do you find heads with no, or plants with no agents at all in them, so that would be the gray. So what's going on here? Why do we find, um, we find agents everywhere, why are we still having such robust uh, napweed populations? Well, one sort of hypothesis uh, that's building out of the existing data we have uh, collected so far is that there's some associate, or these knapweeds, as I suggested, are uh, spread widely on the landscape. Um, they um, encounter highly diverse habitats. Um, and so one example of, of those habitats and environments that they encounter is the kind of length of the growing season. So on the x-axis here, I've got uh, degree days above five degrees Celsius, um, so going from very short growing seasons on the left to much longer growing seasons on the right. And on the y-axis, I have the Lorinus attack rate. So that's the proportion of seed heads um, that are attacked by Lorinus in a given site. Um, the fit is not particularly tight. If you look at the um, R squareds up here, the, the, the reason there's two different lines there is I've excluded this, this weirdo from um, Rabbit Ridge out in the Far East Kootenai. Um, and when you do that, the fit gets a little stronger. But all things considered, given that these sites were not selected for you know, their continuity or their, their proximity to each other, we've got highly diverse habitats here. We do find, um, 
surprisingly, a, a strong or a reasonable relationship between growing season length and the rhinus species attack rate, such that at short growing season sites, we have relatively low attack, and at long growing season uh, sites, we have um, considerably more attack. Um, and so we're quite intrigued by that. Um, it seems to be that, you know, despite like huge variation in habitat, and I'll show you some photos in a minute of that, um, that we can find these kinds at all. Um, and so we're chasing that down now. We had an honor student come out this summer and she did a really nice job setting up these three elevational transects. These span over a thousand meters each, um, going from about 600 meters at the bottom to uh, basically the upper elevational range limit of spotted knapweed in Southern BC, which occurs around 1600 meters. And on each transect establishing between like nine and 12 study sites. At each of those sites, uh, I should say her name, Emma, Emma's done a great job here. She's an undergraduate honors thesis, went out and did this work all summer long. She visited these sites each week um, and at each time identified the, uh, or quantified, I guess, the um, abundance and density of uh, seed head feeding weevils, the Lorinus weevils, and then the uh, phenostages of the plants, as well as the density um, of those plants. And so the idea here is looking at, do we see um, Lorinus co-occurring with knapweed all the way across its elevation? Uh, does that uh, translate into reproductive success. So she'll be dissecting seed heads that we've collected over the winter. Um, and do we see sort of a disjunct distribution between the successful control agents um, and the distribution of spotted knapweed um, in Southern BC? So it looks like I'm, I'm gonna be on time here. We've got a couple of take home messages. The first is that we have seen a decline in spotted knapweed, but that this has been much slower um, and, and resulted in not nearly the, the almost elimination um, that we saw with diffuse snapweed. And population fluctuations continue both in time and space. Uh, Nate Harms did a, did a review a couple of years back there talking about this pattern for widely distributed um, invasive uh, weeds um, and highlighted some of the like um, good hypotheses from uh, sort of range limit ecology and evolution that can be applied uh, to invasive uh, weed species. Um, and in this case, we're specifically like as an Emma's little project coming up there, trying to get after the evolutionary ecology of both the agents um, and the weeds across this environmental variation and apply some of those um, well-developed hypotheses about um, the limits to species distributions um, that can be tested in invasive plant systems. As has been mentioned throughout today, uh, continued monitoring is required to best understand uh, the biocontrol um, of long-lived species, especially when we're talking about trying to um, incur mortality. Um, I think it was Phil was talking about um, uh, Russian olive, where the goal is, of course, just to reduce um, the spread, not to kill trees that people like to have in their yard. Um, in, in this case, we're kind of caught in between these two, two ideas. We're trying to suppress the populations down, but it's still a very long lived species, despite being a kind of a herb. It lives for a long time. Um, we want to kill as many plants as we can while maintaining a, a small population of individuals as a reservoir or stepping stone, as Bern mentioned, um, for, for biocontrol agents. Um, and build up over top of that, of course, is the diverse habitats where these species occur. So on the you know, bottom left here, we have very hot, dry, some of the driest places in BC where we get still get some spotted knapweed. There's, there's cactus that grow at, at this site here um, to more mesic conditions um, to, you know, almost subalpine conditions. And hopefully you can just see these flowering plants here um, in the bottom right. On top of all that, of course, land use remains a big challenge. That, that site I showed you off the top where we have a nice drop off in, in, in spotted knapweed and they haven't come back. Um, there's no more grazing in that site. Similarly, this site in the bottom left here, um, cattle grazing has been eliminated and population density of spotted knapweed is extremely low with little pockets occurring on rocky outcrops um, that of course are hammered by biocontrol agents. So that remains an ongoing ongoing challenge um, for these systems. Okay, so that's a bit of the story that we've been working on with spotted knapweed. I just wanted to touch on a couple of the other biocontrol programs that we're, we're addressing here um, in Summerland. Um, and I wanted to show you the map of where we are uh, indicated by the arrow down on the right here, kind of in this little finger of the Great Basin, which stretches up from Washington, and that is the Okanagan Valley of BC. Uh, here's our research center above Okanagan Lake. Um, we're working primarily um, on Rob's sort of stage seven, these long-term follow-up projects. So spotted knapweed is one of those. Um, St. John, St. John's wort is another one. Here's a population of St. John's wort, not far from our research center, which is uh, clearly doing just fine. 
Um, but we're also starting to support more of these pre-release studies on things like Tree of Heaven um, and associated um, agricultural pest and invasive insect spotted lanternfly, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. Um, parrot's feather, an aquatic species that I'm working with uh, Phil Weil a little bit on. Um, flowering rush and garlic mustard, um, where we're assisting sort of with pre-release monitoring studies of those species. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone who's supported this work in addition to my co-authors, uh, the BC Ministry of Forests for mercifully changing their name to just that. Um, support from AFC Lethbridge is specifically Rob's team over there, uh, BC Parks for facilitating our work and all the contributions of both staff and summer students uh, to build in some of the data that I've shown you today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I do want to share with you that I spend a lot of time in the month of August with Cyphocleonis, and I have absolutely had a few of them fly at me. I typically Amazing. say they fly like chickens, not very well, probably wouldn't disperse well, but they typically will try and fly and crash into you. Fantastic. You should write that up as a little note for an entomology journal. <laughs> Yay, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. We've been thinking they've been flying for years and we haven't been able to see it, but it's amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. We, you know, I don't know, maybe it's something because most of the places I collect are very close to where Jim Story, you know, really worked a lot with those agents. So I don't know, maybe he worked some magic on them and they just fly around <laughs> here. Well, they have wings. So it's, we've been saying it for years. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll try and capture it on video for you sometime. Um, so we do have just a couple minutes for questions for you, Dave. Um, one of the questions I came in for you is uh, if the two knapweed species that you mentioned, diffuse and spotted, have ever been um, documented to hybridize. Um, that's a great question. They, uh, they don't in the introduced range. Uh, there's some cyto incompatibilities when you're um, of two different ploidy levels. So as I said, spotted napwood here appears to be a tetraploid um, and the introduced diffuse here appears to be diploid. They do hybridize in the native range uh, readily. Yeah, so that it definitely happens over in Europe and some interesting questions and work going on uh, in the Czech Republic and Germany looking at sort of how that um, different ploidy levels and and hybridization and back crossing influences the um, invasion over there. They're, they're not, I guess, not calling it strictly an invasion, but you're seeing like the tetraploid spotted um, moving um, kind of towards the northwest uh, throughout Europe. Hmm, very interesting. I didn't realize that. There, oh, I should, other... one, one, sorry, one last point on that. There hmm. are uh, putative hybrids here. So um, diffuse spotted hybrids that so they are diploids, um, but it's hypothesize that they were introduced as such, not that it occurred here. Okay. Okay, great. Um, one other question that wasn't directed towards you, but I think it's a, a great question for everybody that's presenting today, is uh, if you've ever run into any negative public response to biocontrol agent releases, and if you have, if that's impacted efforts that have been made. Yeah, we, we often get, you know, the I'm sure everyone here has, has had this experience where you get, you know, sighting by a member of the public of some, you know, cane toads or some other disaster along those lines. Um, my, my usual response tends to be that, you know, that, that, and then examples, I think of like the, some of the, uh, this, one of the thistle agents that Canada released, the U.S. has like harsh penalties in for moving. Um, you know, those examples, we, we knew that those things could occur and just did it anyway, because we didn't care. Nowadays are, um, the pre-release testing, you know, is so rigorous and so intensive that 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 risks for non-target attack are low. One place that we do run into issues is, and I'm sure this happens in the in the states as well, but in BC especially, there's increasing recognition of sort of uh, First Nations title uh, to land, and First Nations groups, on average, their gut reaction is, "Don't bring in non-native things. We don't care what they are." Um, that's been the general reaction of the First Nations I've worked with. Um, but once we kind of get into the nitty gritty and start talking about what's going on, how safe it is, and and the you know, the alternatives, um, as kind of highlighted earlier in the day today, I think by and large they have been uh, supportive um, of in, of introducing control agents. So yes, we get pushback, and there. And then the, the final point I guess I should make there is that we get pushback from stakeholders who say it doesn't work. Or, or research groups who just don't 
just aren't convinced um, that it's an effective uh, method of control. And often that stems, in my experience anyway, um, from a belief that it should be eradicating the species. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Dave. I think you did a great job of summarizing and answering multiple points about that question. So now we are going to move into the Southwest region of the United States. And in interest of time, we lumped together kind of an interesting group of states from the Southwest and the South that are typically um, focused on you know, similar weed species, biocontrol of similar weed species. Um, and our first presenter for this region is John Goolsby with USDA Agricultural Research Service. So take it away, John. Everything looks great on this end. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to the 300 people hanging in there listening to these presentations. And thank you to NISMA for putting this all together. But uh, like you say, let me take you down to the Texas-Mexico border and the challenges we have with this weed called Arundo Donax. And I think it was an easy choice to go for a biocontrol program because it was just so widespread. And Carol uh, Randall mentioned that early on, you know, a weed that's this widespread and there really aren't many options for controlling it. But uh, anyway, we did develop a, a good bio, classical biocontrol program and then we even developed a way to integrate it with mechanical control. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that today. And I just wanted to briefly flash up all the many people that worked on this project, you know, and the diverse group of scientists. So thank you to all of them. This is the plant here. You know, it. this is what it looked like prior to the biocontrol program in 2009. You know, dense stands along the Rio Grande, all of its tributaries, uh, along ditches, irrigation canals, just uh, such a dominant plant in these riparian habitats. And even though it has this big seed head, the seeds are non-viable, so it spreads, spreads by movement of rhizomes and and uh, other you know parts of the plant. So it uh, it also just loves fire, and you know the more people you know try to burn it out or whatever, it really responds favorably to those you know uh, actions. It's really a, a bad weed all around the world, pretty much wherever the uh, Mediterranean Europeans colonized, you know the Spanish and the French. So it. Um, the work that we have done here has been spread around the world now to help out these other countries that face this issue with giant reed. So the impacts in the in the of Arundo Donax in the Rio Grande Basin, I should say, you know, are many. And uh, the genesis of the program was water availability. You know, we're in a very arid area, dependent on you know the Rio Grande for water, and uh, we knew that this plant was using a lot of water, and uh, we looked at our the results of our collaborators in uh, in South Africa from their working for water program and uh, by using biocontrol to control invasive weeds in South Africa they were able to really conserve water and increase their water availability so part of science is looking around the world and finding out what other people are doing so they were our inspiration so the cane also has strong environmental impacts it it causes uh, stream bank erosion it, it, the plant dominates the native plant community, you know, affects the bird populations and, you know, just about everything along these critical refuges along this desert river. And um, the, one of the unusual things, though, is that it affected national security, you know, because this is an international border, heavily patrolled by the, you know, the U.S. Border Patrol you know, the plant interfered with their visibility and maneuverability along the international border. So a lot of the funding came from this agency. So you'll hear me mentioning, you know, the tie-ins to the needs of our stakeholder there at the Border Patrol, you know, to deal with this plant. And personally, I'm very glad that they reached out to USDA for a partnership because I think we are much better suited to develop a solution for them you know, that would be long-term and sustainable and environmentally friendly. The other unusual thing that came up kind of midway through the program is the impact of this plant on animal health. And what it does is it creates a favorable environment on the U.S. side of the, the river for uh, invasion of, of cattle fever ticks. And the cattle fever ticks uh, or have been eradicated from the U.S. They're 
They're not native to the U.S., but they cause a lethal cattle disease. So by uh, the plant allows the tick to come over and facilitates the, the reintroduction because it creates this nice shady environment with, you know, very few uh, predators on the ground that would eat the tick. So by controlling the plant, uh, we've also been able to accomplish that goal. So I want to show you some pictures of the Arundo invasion, you know, prior to the biocontrol program, just basically to show you the magnitude and size of this plant. Here you see uh, one of the main tributary rivers to the Rio Grande, the Conchos. You know, this river deep down into Chihuahua, Mexico, just lined with the Rundo, sucking up water. They actually call it El Ladron de Agua in this area, the water thieves, so they know the impacts that it has. As you go down the river, you know, through Del Rio, you know, vast stands of this plant uh, along the, in the riparian corridors, which just, you know, dominates everything and, and uh, certainly makes it impassable to, to work down in these areas. Uh, down to Laredo, you see these thin bands of, of the cane along the river. You're looking across to Mexico there. And I like this picture because it shows what the native riparian vegetation would look like on the U.S. side. So that's that was kind of our goal early on is to make it look like, you know, the, the U.S. side there on both sides. And then finally down to the Rio Grande Valley where I'm working in near Westlaco. And um, this is what the plant looked like uh, along that irrigation canal. And, and uh, now it's just hardly even present there at all. So anyway, you're looking at what it looked like when we first got started. And, you know, that was, you know, nearly 20 years ago. But we've, it's a pretty short timeline for a biocontrol program, I would say. So look at this plant now in Mediterranean Europe where it's native. You know, along the coast and in, in Mount Malaga, just a little patches here and there. You look at this stand there and on the Ebro River, which is ideal habitat for Arundo Donax, deep gravelly, you know, loam on both sides of the river. If this was the U.S., it would be so thick and dense, you wouldn't be able to see across the river there to those, you know, apartment blocks. And uh, Further up into France, you see the dominance of the insects here above ground and below ground, keeping this plant just very thin, you know, brittle, and you know, certainly not dominating its environment. So biocontrol, you know, really appealed to all the stakeholders, you know, because it was long-term and sustainable, you know, low cost considering, you know, the benefits over such a big area. But it was really important for us to get a binational agreement with our, our neighbors in Mexico because we we really, to get the water savings and everything needed from this program, we really needed to have good binational cooperation. And we had a very strong team in Mexico that was mirroring all of our operations on the U.S. side. So here's the agents that we found in Europe. And uh, on the left, you have the Arundo wasp. You know, then the Arundo scale that fed below ground on the rhizomes or roots of the plant, and then the leaf feeding uh, midge, the Vasiopter donassis, and uh, the the shoot feeder. And uh, the first three agents were, were of course, uh, permitted. They were determined to be safe and effective, and didn't feed on any other native plants or economic plants. But this, the last agent that the, the Arundo fly, Cryptonevra, did feed on one of one grass, so we had to reject that. But anyway, I'm just giving you the big picture of how we selected all of these agents. And it was early on, a lot of people said there wouldn't be good agents on a grass, you know, but we did find them and they were specific and effective. So let me tell you the rest of the story now. So here's the wasp. They're unusual in that they're only a, they're, they're parthenogenic that they give birth to females. There are no males in the population. And um, the life cycle is about 30 days. Uh, the female lays her egg into the stem and uh, it, it starts to produce gall tissue, which is like very soft uh, tumor tissue. And that's what the larvae of this wasp feeds on. And uh, these big galls really stunt the plant and reduce its overall growth and uh, cause it to produce side shoots, which, you know, were further attacked by the wasp. So it really does have a profound architectural kind of attack on the plant, but it's subtle. And uh, like all the other people have said before me in their talks, you have to be patient, 
you know, the type of attack that this insect does on the plant is, it's hard to see at first, but over time, it really does have a big impact. So here's the type of damage that it does producing these big galls. So you can imagine a lot of nutrient uh, and resource of the plant goes into producing these galls, which are solely for the benefit of these uh, wasp larvae. So it's really a, you know, like a cancer tumor would be in a human, it's really taken away a lot of valuable resources from this plant that would allow it to grow. We really like this wasp and its impact. So we figured out how to mass rear it into the millions and we released these uh, wasps by air. That's the, one of the USDA aircraft there. And it was really necessary to do this because our, our release environment uh, along the river was so remote and distant it made it uh, really handy to be able to just fly over and drop the insects. So, and mostly private land. So it, this was really a, a really quick and efficient way to release the agents. So within a very short period of time, really just seven years or less than five years after release of the agents, we, we saw a nice decline in the cane. You know, uh, um, the y-axis is showing, you know, the kilograms of biomass and, um, the x-axis time and, and the different locations. And you can see the blue bars would be before release of the agents and the red bars would be after release. So we pretty quickly could see that we were reducing biomass all along the Rio Grande. And uh, we calculated that we were saving, you know, at least 6,000 acre feet of water per year, which is enough for a small city like the city of McAllen where I live. So that's very valuable economically in such an arid area as Texas. So we also increased this visibility into the stands, you know, from less than six feet to over 27. And this was a really big thing for the Border Patrol. They felt safer working there. They could see more effectively. So instead of a knee-jerk reaction of applying herbicides or trying to, you know, burn it all down or something, you know, the biocontrol program gave them something that they wanted with uh, really, you know, no impact, negative impact on the environment. And what's more, you know, we began pretty quickly to see that once we started to thin these stands out, light would come down through the Arundo and the native plants began returning. You know, the plant, the Arundo had lost its dominance and the native plants were taking advantage of that. So we really wanted to look at water water quantity and quality. And uh, we set up uh, these expensive uh, machines, eddy covariance machines to measure water use here along the Rio Grande. And uh, we were able to show that within a year after release of the insects, the use of the water or evapotranspiration at the site, you know, went down, you know, all through the year. So that was a really good finding, you know, to show that uh, there just, the damage that this wasp was doing to the plant was was making it harder for the plant to uptake water. And, you know, the more water that we can reduce, the water use that we can reduce by the cane, you know, drinking the water, you know, that's water that doesn't need to be taken out of the river, you know, or conserving water in the river for other uses downstream. So it was important to document uh, water conservation for the overall economics of the program. So we also could see that as biomass was reduced, we began to we saw a nice correlation with date of plants returning. And uh, from at our sites, we would go from almost no native plants at all to, you know, 44 different plant species, data plant species returning in really just a short time. And, and it was highest where you had the greatest reduction in biomass. So over time, you know, starting in 2007, you know, before release of the agents, you can see this nice step down in reduction of biomass over time. So it wasn't immediate. And, you know, like many speakers have said, you know, that's a good thing. It allows time for the native plants to start reproducing. And for us here along the river, if we would have, killed all the Arundo really quickly, we would have probably been producing a soil bank erosion, which would have been very bad for the river ecosystem as well. So we also realized that we needed to introduce a mechanical method, you know, mainly because our stakeholders said, is there something more you can do? We really like this visibility and everything, but can you take it 
down even more and make the uh, create a bigger view shed. So we looked at different ways to uh, cut the cane and what we call topping. So we developed uh, you know large scale uh, tractors with these boom cutter bars on there that could cut the cane at one meter. And I'll tell you more about that one meter here in a minute. But you know you probably would think, well, why not just cut the cane all the way to the ground? But uh, remember, this is a grass. And grasses really love to be mowed. Uh, you know, they come right back. So the instinct of land managers to cut the rundo donax to the ground is really making the problem much worse because it's eliminating the biocontrol agents and uh, cutting out all the competitors. And the cane comes back even, you know, more strong. So it's um, it's kind of counterintuitive to cut the plant at one meter, but it is catching on now, you know, in this environment along the river as the way to go to accelerate the decline of Arundo Donax. So here's uh, the, a picture of the kind of tests that we conducted, you know, uncut, fully grown cane, cut down to the ground, cut at one meter, cut at two meter. And then we, we looked at the partitioning of the plant into different parts of the plant, like leaf, stem, side shoots. And uh, let me show you some data on how this shakes out and why we decided that you know, one meter was the right way to go to cut the plant. And if here's a, a graphic here showing um, really one thing you have to look at is that yellow box. You know, when you cut the plant down to the ground, you get very few side shoots the next year. And can you remember early in the presentation, I was telling you that the Tetramisa ravana, the Arundo wasp, really likes to reproduce in side shoots. So look at the one meter and two meter here. We're dramatically increasing, you know, the partitioning of plant resources into side shoots. So with more side shoots, you have more wasps, you have more stunting, you know, they fly on to attack other plants nearby. So this uh, cutting of the plant or topping of the plant, you know, at this one to two meter height really accelerated the decline and the impact of the biocontrol agents. So that um, led to you know, large scale programs along the river where we could, you know, do the show the before and after. But uh, you can see before, I mean, there's pretty good decline of the cane from the agents. But when we come in and top, you know, we get the, the nice production of side shoots. But so we have more of the biocontrol agents, but we're also giving, you know, our stakeholder a better view of the river. And then ultimately, uh, recovery of the native vegetation and these riparian habitats because as you can see, the sun can penetrate down to the soil level to stimulate this regrowth. So for the for the stakeholder, you know, they could see over 300 yards at this site. And, you know, that had never been possible, you know, before. So it really reduces the risk and, you know, security, you know, here for the agents to work in the, these areas along the border. So they were really happy with the integration of this mechanical and bio and use of biological control. So I would say, you know, in summary, you know, that Arundo Donax received all this funding, which allowed us to do all the sap, the, the science in a, a pretty rapid manner because it uh, had so many different impacts, you know, socially, politically, agriculturally, environmentally, you know, in a a really gigantic area of the Rio Grande Basin that encompassed not only the U.S., but Mexico. So because of the problem, it really warranted a, a really robust biological control program. And uh, it pretty quickly, we could see that we were producing significant economic benefits. So that, you know, made everybody happy, especially the, uh, the people that need irrigation water and are having to deal with availability of scarce resource water resources. So a great strategy for the long term, you know, because the biocontrol agents are always there, always doing their job, you know, on both sides of the, the river. So that is something that's hard to find in any other strategy like, you know, chemical. So the the three, you know, we did manage to get the three agents out and uh, two of them established. So that was a pretty good uh, accomplishment uh, in that period of time. I think the the armored scale below ground is going to be a great agent, but 
you know, like many of the people, uh, the presenters have said before, it's going to take time because it's not a good disperser. And it takes, it's a, only reproduces, you know, two to three generations per year as compared to the wasp uh, producing eight to 10 per year. So one of the most significant benefits was this conservation of, uh, of water and being able to document that. And that conservation right there came out to $5 million dollars in benefits per year. So we were very quickly able to pay back the, uh, you know, the taxpayer for the funds that came into this program with just be, being able to pay back that funding in just a few years. And then after that, it's just all saved money that would be otherwise, uh, you know, not available. So look at this picture be before and after. Everybody likes these pictures, but at this site along the Rio Grande and the Rio Grande Valley, you can see what it looked like, you know, back at the start there in 2009. And then here you see my, my collaborator, Patrick Moran, there at the same exact location in 2022, you know, over 55% uh, reduction in biomass. You have sunlight penetrating the ground there. You know, you can't see it in this picture, but there are numerous native trees regrowing there, shading and, you know, further competing against the Arundo at this uh, location. So it, it takes time, but not that much time, really, if you have the resources to do a good program. And I want to say to the land managers, this may seem like a, a big program that you could never possibly pull off, but there are some things that you can do even with small scale infestations of the Arundo Donax. And that would be to, you know, get the agents for release, get them established there, of course. But, you know, topping of the cane at one meter will really accelerate the decline of that plant. And that's something that can be done with loppers or hedgers, you know, on stands at your location. And if you want to talk about it later, I'd be happy to, to talk to you and give you some advice on how to implement that. because. Right now, we're in the midst of doing all this at Big Bend National Park. So I have a feel for what you need in your areas. And I'll bet many of you on the call today have this plant, uh, you know, growing on your landscape. So let me know if you have further questions. Thank so, you, John. I think we're about seven minutes over. Okay. So I think we I'll might just, have to move on. Um, thank you. To, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, if anybody has any questions for John, please put them in the Q&A and he will respond to those. Um, so our next presenter from the Southwest region is Paul Pratt with USDA Agricultural Research Service. So go ahead and take it away, Paul. I started talking and my mute button was still on. Can you hear me now? Yes, you sound great, great. and the slide looks great. Cool. Hey, so everybody, my name is Paul Pratt, and I'm the research leader of the Invasive Species and Pollinator Health Research Unit. We're located in Albany, California, but I am so passionate and love my job so much that I'm participating um, from a, a vacation, and I'm in a hotel. So hopefully the Wi-Fi holds up in the hotel room, and uh, we don't have any technical difficulties. So, arrow. For some reason now it's not advancing. Let's try that. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to make sure that I highlighted various collaborators and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the European Biocontrol Lab, FUEDE, uh, BBCA, INIA, and uh, CDFA, all collaborators that provide us a lot of support, uh, not only uh, just coordinating foreign surveys, but also the implementation of biological control. And then for those uh, that are interested, I'm going, my very last slide, I'm going to have a link to the International Symposium on Biocontrol of Weeds, which will be in Iguazu, Argentina in May of 2023. So those of you that just can't get enough of weed biological control, uh, come participate in that meeting. All right, so as was mentioned earlier, uh, we have an interesting Southwest region, which includes states like California and Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, but also Kansas and Oklahoma. And I reached out to individuals uh, in these states to try to gain some information about the biocontrol 
development specifically, specifically development of new biological control agents uh, out of these areas and didn't come up with anyone in, in several of the states as you see on this slide. So if you're working in this area and you're developing biological control, connect with me so that we can have a better presentation in the future for whoever is asked to give this talk. Uh, but you'll see that from Texas, I coordinated with John Goolsby, who just spoke with Nathan Harms, who's been mentioned previously, Dave Thompson in New Mexico, and then a whole suite of uh, individuals in California, including Chris uh, Brokant, who I think is on the call today and uh, is with CDFA. I'll also mentioned Tom Dudley, who's with uh, UC Santa Barbara. The other individuals from California are with the USDA and working in, in the unit that I work in. Okay, so starting out with Texas and uh, just mentioning guinea grass. So John just gave a talk about uh, this perennial grass, Arundo donax. Well, there's another one looming on the horizon. It's got a lot of different names used here. I listed everything so that you can see uh, how it's taxonomically referred to in various uh, different publications, but it's a newer program. The plant is native to Africa. And John uh, Goolsby expressed a, an intent to bring in agents targeting this weed, guinea grass, in the next year. He has another Tetramessa species that's coming from South Africa, and he's pretty excited about that. So that's up and coming, kind of down the road a ways, uh, but just check in with John Goolsby, whose email address is on this slide if you want more details. Jumping to New Mexico, um, I was talking to to, to Dave Thompson, and he said that they're not in the, they're not actively developing new biological control agents. So there's nothing in the pipeline immediately as they're focusing on conservation and augmentation of their existing biological control agents. But he said, Paul, hey, maybe mention that we are conducting surveys uh, of mesquite in New Mexico and, and the Southwest for South African biocontrol practitioners. And so it's a reverse program where a plant from the United States is a problem in South Africa, and he is surveying natural enemies to share with them in their efforts to control uh, an invasive plant that's displacing native species. Uh, he also shared, and I hope I'm not uh, uh, speaking out of turn, but uh, Dave mentioned the R word, retirement, and so just keep that in mind. Uh, who knows how New Mexico State will uh, deal with that vacancy in the coming future. So uh, we wish Dave all the best in whatever retirement plans he may have. Now, moving on to California. Um, so salsola is a species, a tumbleweed, you know, kind of the classical southwestern or Californian invasive species that shows up in cartoons and movies whenever we're talking about the westerns. But uh, as, as a major pest and, and an issue that affects lots of different aspects of not only agriculture, but also uh, transportation and accidents along the highways, fire, fuel, things of that nature. Uh, biological control has been targeting this weed for <clears throat> a couple of decades. And uh, an areophyid mite, one of these small microscopic mites, Aceria salsoli, uh, attacks the stems and buds of plants and uh, causes these gall-like formations that you can see in the picture in the bottom right. So this was originally petitioned for release as a biological control agent to tag in 2009, but there were some concerns and so additional testing was completed. The tag petition was revised recently and uh, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife provided concurrence uh, suggesting that we could move forward with uh, a permit. So APHIS, and I think Bob Fannin steals on the line today, APHIS is preparing an environmental assessment. It needs to, um, still go through tribal consultation and a formal announcement in the federal register. So we're maybe hopeful that we can make a release in 2023. Maybe I'm overly optimistic. So Lincoln Smith has retired, but he remains very active in an emeritus status. And so he's still answering his emails. And if you have questions specifically about this program, there's his email address there. Okay. Um, moving on to Cape Ivy. Uh, there's a digitivalva leaf miner, which uh, feeding causes quite a bit of foliar damage and really stunts the plants, reduces uh, reproduction as a function of feeding on the leaves and, and the foliage. So a petition for this organism was uh, submitted in 2012, and then it was being revised 
Uh, a couple of additional plans are being tested and those tests are completed. So we're expecting to submit a tag petition in early 2023 for this one. So this one's going to, to join the gall forming uh, fly that's already in place and established and spreading along California coasts. Uh, so if you have additional questions about this one, Patrick Moran is leading that charge and his email is listed there. I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to start speeding up. So Arundo Donax, you just heard about it. We have this Lassioptera leaf mining midge that has uh, failed to establish, but we're working with a microbiologist, Rebecca Mueller, to see if we can improve that and get it out of quarantine successfully. So that's an active effort to get a new insect on Arundo established. And I'm going to go through this quickly. There's a lot of text on this slide, but Water hyacinth continues to be a problem in, uh, in California, where cooler temperatures result in the suite of biological control agents that Melissa was talking about somewhat ineffective. And so we're in the process of looking for biotypes that are better adapted to cooler conditions. And working with this on this with Nathan Harms, we have a biotype from Australia, strangely enough, that was native to Argentina released in Florida, transferred to Australia. Now we're seeking permission to transfer it back to the United States where it can uh, hopefully help control water hyacinth in these Northern more temperate areas. Ditto with alligator weed. We have the same issue with alligator weed. It's invading Northern California waterways and, and what we call the, the California Delta where the Sacramento and San Joaquin water combines into make into this large wetland system and alligator weed is wreaking havoc as of 2015. It's a new invader in, the, in California and Northern California, I should say, it's been in Southern California for decades. Uh, the alligator flea beetle, which has been wildly successful, one of the great all time examples has failed to establish in Northern California. So again, looking for a better adapted biotype of already successful biocontrol agent. And we found one in Buenos Aires, and uh, we're working on doing some initial host range testing to confirm that it is just as uh, host specific as the original biotype that was released and submitting that to TAG. And again, Nathan and I are working on this because not only California, but other areas of the South in, the, in Northern Louisiana, Arkansas, and other places, alligator weed continues to be a problem. Uh, we've released Ceratapian, uh, which is the, the crown root weevil that's feeding on uh, yellow star thistle. And the release has happened in 2020, 2021. And in 2022, we've seen evidence of establishment, which we're really excited. But this thing is very difficult to rear. So I encourage you to reach out to some of those collaborating laboratories and they may be able to provide insects for future releases. Link Smith and Brian Rector are individuals that you can uh, seek additional information from and their email addresses are there. And Japanese knotweed, I think it's already in the question and answer. So look for details there, but Chris Orkent from CDFA has been working on this in Humboldt County and may have uh, additional information, but unfortunately no evidence of establishment yes, yet for the knotweed psyllid in Northern California. And Gorse, a new Thrips was released in collaboration with Joel Price from Oregon Department of Agriculture and Fritzi Grebstad. And uh, so far, I took lead on this and we released it at six sites in California. Little of evidence. So population densities are very low. We're talking one in two insects recovered uh, after releases. So we're hopeful, being patient, and continuing to monitor these release sites for the new Gorse Thrips that was released recently. We have a lot of additional agents. Here's the list. I'm not gonna go through them now because I'm out of time already, but uh, uh, I'd be happy to share the contact information of those that are working and leading the charge. But these are additional target weeds that uh, were bringing organisms into quarantine, but testing has not revealed anything specific yet. And so we're continuing to work. Just another plug for the International Symposium of Biocontrol of Weeds, which is the 7th through the 12th, May, 2023 at Iguazu. And here's the link. So check that out. And I encourage everyone to attend if possible. Melissa, I'm gonna stop there because I know we're already over and, uh, and hopefully this will help us get back on, on track.
Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. I was gonna say thank you for helping us get catch up a little bit on time there. Um, so now we are going to move to Hawaii. Um, and I think, I mean, I can only speak for myself personally, but I'm very excited to hear these updates. So our first presenter from Hawaii is Paul Zwang, and he uh, works for the Ohuli Huli Forest Conservancy. So Paul, I think if you go on your um, left, the bottom left-hand corner and you click on, well, now it's all grayed out, but you click on the furthest right icon there. Is it, okay, sorry, I was on mute. Where do I do the, you know, the full screen thing, you know, to get the slideshow to start? I, I'm not seeing it now. Can you hear me? Hmm. Yes, I can hear you. Um, so because that slideshow that. button didn't work on the top, huh? Well, that's the thing. I don't see slide. I see mute, start video, oh. participants, chat, Q and A. Oh no, oh. on your screen, not on the Zoom. So on the um, like PowerPoint, it says home, themes, yeah, table, okay. charts. There, go. there you go. Looks great. Take it away. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So good morning to evening, wherever you may be. My name is Paul Zwang and I'm the only landowner presenting today. Uh, this presentation summarizes observations and what we think we've learned during the course of the 10 year history of deploying the Tectococcus ovatus biocontrol at Waikani. Waikani Valley is on the island of Oahu in the central Ko'olau Mountains on its windward side, shown here. The upper half of Waikani Valley is situated between approximately 75 to 750 meters above sea level. Uh, rain averages from one and a half meters in the mid to lower portions of the valley. Um, uh, to over five and a half meters at the summit. The forests are classified as mesic to wet, and the five most abundant native trees growing on ridges and slopes at mid-level areas are Ohia, Koa, Kopiko, Ahakea, and Lama. The principal introduced trees are many, but the one I'd like to focus on today is the mid-sized tree, Sidium, Catalianum, or what is commonly called strawberry guava. Strawberry guava is one of the most impactful trees in Hawaii and is responsible for much of the destruction of natives, native forests at the mid to high elevations. Restoration at Waikani started in 2012 using an all volunteer workforce. Restoration includes three principal activities. The one I like to focus on is number three, where we're conducting forest restoration of strawberry guava thickets. Um, and that's why this Tectococcus ovatus biocontrol plays an important role. And just let me explain what we're doing because this is important for a later slide. We remove these thickets not all at once, but we stage it over four years. So we take out 25% of the trees in year one, 25% of the years in tree, uh, trees in year two, et cetera. And importantly, in year one, we outplant native ground cover um, uh, and seedlings to uh, prevent weeds from coming into the strawberry guava thicket that we're um, removing. <clears throat> Um, a second. Yeah, so this is a photograph of the strawberry guava thicket being prepared for forest restoration. The trees are typically 15 to 20 feet in height and form a dense canopy so that few understory 
or ground cover plants can grow beneath the deep shade. In this photograph, strawberry guava trees less than one inch in diameter have been removed to facilitate walking through the restoration site. So how does the biocontrol work? The biocontrol agent is a scale insect, very small in size, called Tectococcus ovatus, that originates in the forests of Brazil, where strawberry guava is a native tree. In Brazil, Tectococcus ovatus, uh, in Brazil, Tectococcus ovatus doesn't kill the trees, but helps to keep the strawberry guava under control. And that's the goal of deploying Tectococcus ovatus in the forests here in Hawaii. So here's the timeline that we documented over the 10 years, part of the, uh, the, the timeline. The project started at the end of September of 2012, so about 10 years ago, with site preparation at four sites. Each site contained 10 to 20 trees growing within a one meter by two meter area. Two sites were located on southwest facing slopes, one site on a northeast facing slope, and a fourth on a ridge top. The trees were cut down to two to three feet tall stumps. And what that does is that forces these trees to sprout new stems, as you can see in this photograph. Um, by December 17th, the stumps sprouted to about one to two foot long containing new growth stems and leaves. The new leaves initially are colored red, as you can kind of see at the top of the photo. Um, and then as they mature, turn green with time. Uh, it is the red leaves that are the preferred target for the, tecto uh, for the tectococcus uh, biocontrol. So here we are on that uh, day of introduction, December 23rd, there's Tracy Johnson leading the charge. Notice he's securing a one gallon pot containing an infected strawberry guava plant and putting it in absolute close proximity, overlapping with the target reddish leaves so the goals can transfer from one plant to the other. And then voila, on January 12th of the following year, transfer occurs. The first skulls um, uh, form these pimple-like circular features on the leaves highlighted by the black arrows. So now we're going to talk about the spread across the landscape. And although it's, you know, been criticized as being slow, actually, it's really not that slow because there's some things that if you pay attention to and, and apply, you can speed up the process. For example, uh, March to April is the uh, best time to uh, spread tectococcus because that's when the trees are naturally leafing out and thus, produ thus producing the young leaves that attract the, uh, the, the biocontrol insects. Ridge lines are better then gullies or slopes as they allow wind dispersal to help spread the bio, the bio control across the landscape. And really best to have a high density of strawberry guava trees located downwind where tectococcus uh, is being released to take advantage of this wind dispersal. Okay. The methods for transferring galls, we've uh, learned a lot. Here's a list of some of the common ways to transfer the galls uh, into the strawberry guava trees. In the interest of time, I'll just speak to the method that we found most impactful, and that is floral water tubes inserted into 10 foot long PVC pipes. You know, these floral water tubes, you can buy them on Amazon. They're readily available. So what you do is you insert a pencil thick strawberry guava, a freshly cut strawberry guava stem loaded with goals of various ages and stages into the floral tubes, like the one shown in this slide. Then insert the floral tube containing the cut stem into the end of the 10 foot long PVC pipe. Make sure to fill up the tubes with water, obviously, because that'll allow the stem to remain viable for about 10 days to, to two weeks. Um, oh, sorry, position the PVC pipe with the tectococcus stem directly against the target. That is 
critical. Can't be a foot away. It's got to be touching. The red colored leaves uh, uh, forming the new growth high in the canopy. That's where you want to put it. Once in position, then you secure the 10 foot long pole against the target tree using rope or flagging tape. This method will allow you to transfer Tectococcus into the canopy in a reliable way, thus saving one or two or more years compared to other methods where transfer occurs at lower levels in the target tree. Now, here's one of the major findings that uh, we found. In February of 2015, when straining to find gulls high in the canopy above our heads, so that we could monitor the gall spread across the canopy, we found galls on the strawberry guava seedlings at our feet. This was completely unexpected. <clears throat> There's, this is highly significant. And let me make the following three points. The first is that we have never observed the, we have never observed the infected seedlings growing into larger seedlings or developing into saplings, let alone trees. They just seem to perish. The second point is, recall that we restore strawberry guava thickets over a four year period, meaning that mature strawberry guava trees are present in the restoration sites during this process until the final trees are removed in year four. So what that means is that each year, one needs to weed the strawberry guava seedlings that are sprouting from the fruit of these existing trees. But with the establishment of Tectococcus at the site, the seedlings no longer pose a threat as they don't survive past their first year. This is a huge benefit. The third point is that seedling mortality may be the primary factor in slowing the spread of strawberry guava across the landscape as opposed to previously thought dampening of fruit production and dampening of tree growth. I mean, it's pretty hard for a thicket to spread if it can't generate viable offspring. We recorded in April of 2019 that strawberry guava trees had dropped substantial number of leaves in an apparent response to gall infestation. This is the second major observation made during the study, along with the observation of seedling mortality mentioned earlier. Substantial defoliation would likely lower the tree's capacity to conduct photosynthesis, and thus lower the production of carbohydrate molecules, such as glucose. This drop in energy production as a result of leaf drop may constitute an important factor in lowering flower and fruit production, as well as stymieing tree growth. Another consequence of defoliation is that the shaded forest then becomes noticeably more open, allowing substantially more sunlight to reach the forest floor. This can lead to an explosion of Myconia crenata, grasses and other alien plants, where few existed prior to leaf drop. This is not critical in areas where forest restoration is taking place as the establishment of native ground cover limits the ingress of weeds. But in areas where forest restoration is not taking place, the addition of sunlight becomes problematic. So this is my second to last slide. Just to summarize, the pros are for using uh, Tectococcus is a tool for forest restoration um, that if establishing it in the canopy should, one, noticeably slow, if not stop, its expansion, and two, save countless hours of weeding strawberry guava seedlings where active restoration is occurring. The cons are that establishing Tectococcus may introduce weeds in thickets located outside of where active restoration and outplanning are taking place. And finally, I'd just like to um, give a shout out to three government organizations which were critical in this project, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, US Department of Agriculture, State uh, Department, uh, Hawaii uh, Department of Agriculture, and uh, Department of Forestry and Wildlife. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Paul. That was a great presentation. Very interesting. Not something that all of us, very many of us get to deal with here in the lower 48. Um, so our last presentation today is from Tracy Johnson with USDA Forest Service. Hello there. Hi, Tracy. There we go. Does that look good? We, oh yes, that looks great. Perfect, okay. good to go. All right, now hopefully I won't have any problems. The vacation rental next door sometimes hogs my Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, our biocontrol program in Hawaii and, and focus on uh, upcoming uh, release or, or targets for uh, new projects and uh, releases that are planned. Um, and my partner in this is Darcy Oishi, uh, who's heads of the biocontrol group at the Hawaii Department of Ag. Um, so unfortunately, we have a lot of weeds in Hawaii um, that managers require help with. Um, and we have ecosystems that are under um, a lot of threat from invasive plants. Um, most of our targets have, have, have an origin in the tropics, um, some subtropical also. So that means we don't share a lot of of projects specifically with uh, North America, um, but there are there are some cases of overlap, and I'd li like to highlight in this um, presentation that even if we're not working on exactly the same weed, sometimes we work with the same collaborators internationally, and and long term support of those international collaborators is really important for sustaining uh, biocontrol. Um, and we're in we're involved in the in the full process as are a lot of my uh, biocontrol uh, colleagues um, from selecting targets to exploring uh, the foreign areas where they originate and then testing pot potential uh, biocontrol agents and then releasing and monitoring them. Um, in Hawaii, our main uh, collaborative group in includes uh, my uh, group at the Forest Service. And then the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, uh, who have been leading biocontrol for over uh, a century in Hawaii, and then also the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, especially in the forest areas. Um, one of our, our targets for, uh, for over uh, three decades now has been Myconia. Um, it has shown its impact in Tahiti and then more recently in Hawaii and has been under aggressive management um, for since the 1990s. Um, and so far only one biocontrol was released in the 90s and that does uh, this fungus in the lower right uh, does seem to be having some impact in Tahiti but much less so in Hawaii. Um, and so we're continuing to look for uh, new natural enemies and one that is on the horizon for release is this butterfly uh, Eusolazia chrysopi uh, that has gregarious feeding larvae that defoliate the, the large leaves of myconia. Um, so we're hoping to bring that one in from Costa Rica next year. Um, and then there's a suite of other natural enemies attacking fruit and, uh, and a fungus on the leaves that we're still interested in. Um, so these collaborations, uh, in, in addition to the University of Costa Rica, involve uh, federal university and uh, a regional university in Brazil. So um, those partnerships are, are really important. Uh, another weed in the same family as Myconia um, is Tipichina herbacea, and we have an agent that we are uh, proposed for release and is uh, progressing in the um, permitting process. 
Um, it's a flea beetle that defoliates uh, as larvae and adults. Um, and in this case, I'd like to, to show some of the data. Um, the first graph is the feeding damage on a variety of different test plants. Um, and then uh, the other one shows uh, how many eggs the adults lay on, on those plants. And in case people ever are interested in looking at this kind of specificity data, you'll see very frequently, you'll, you'll see that there's low levels on, on uh, plants that you don't necessarily want the insect to, to uh, feed on. And this is very common in laboratory conditions. <coughs> not cause for alarm uh, most of the time. Um, so it's important to, to look at the data in, in its full context. And in, for this particular agent, there's only three, I'm uh, sorry, four species um, on this list that it can actually sustain its populations on. Um, so when we test it over a long term, we find that it's, it's quite specific. And part of the uh, the benefit to us in Hawaii is that these melastomes that, that, that all of these targets belong to, um, that family is non-native in Hawaii. So uh, pretty much all of the melastomes in Hawaii are invasive. Um, and then a third of species of those is Clydemia. Um, there's been a, a long history of introductions um, by the state and so far, none of those agents from the 50s through the 90s has had a, a really major impact on the weed in the wet forest understory environments where it's really problematic for our, our forests. So we're continuing to look for natural enemies on those. And, and these enemies um, are uh, uh, the two that I'm focusing on are likely to come from uh, Brazil. Um, and they uh, include a gall wasp that uh, affects the fruit and then a, a nematode that infects any new growth and creates galls as well. And I should say uh, the Australians are very interested in, in biocontrol of Clydemia as well. So we're beginning to partner with them in that effort. Um, we're also partnering with them in uh, testing and uh, um, hopefully later in introduction of a, a proven weed biocontrol for a chromolina, uh, which has just in recent decades become an issue in Hawaii. Um, so we currently are testing a few native Hawaiian plants that haven't previously been evaluated uh, against this agent. And then we have uh, some really big trees like Albizia um, that, uh, overtops and drops a lot of new nitrogen onto uh, native forests and overwhelms the native forests in Hawaii. Um, and so we've just in the last decade, we've uh, started exploring for uh, natural enemies in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea um, and have established new partnerships in those um, areas, uh, as well as um, partnering with uh, New Zealand and, and Australia uh, labs that have a long history of work in biocontrol. And another nitrogen fixing uh, invasive tree um, is Morella faya. And it, uh, it also changes the ecosystem in Hawaii by introducing a lot of nitrogen in these nitrogen poor uh, native ecosystems. And so that, uh, has been a target previously by the Forest Service. And there were uh, agents introduced in the past, but they were, uh, they've been completely ineffective so far. Um, so I'm hoping to uh, start a new project in the Canary Islands where there's better biodiversity um, and more likelihood of finding effective natural enemies. And then some other projects that we're involved with, um, and funding, but not actually actively conducting our uh, projects like uh, collaboration with CABI um, that has a long experience in, in conducting biocontrol research. 
and they're helping us look for natural enemies um, for Himalayan raspberry. Uh, and hopefully we will find something that's effective. There's a native raspberry uh, that we have to protect in Hawaii. So this is a, it's a, sets a high bar um, to find something that's sufficiently specific. Um, the CABI is also working on Himalayan ginger um, uh, for us and, and for the New Zealanders. Um, and there's a number of agents, uh, hopefully one or more of them uh, prove sufficiently specific for our use in Hawaii. And then the, the agent that was developed for Florida on Brazilian pepper tree, we have that same weed here in Hawaii. Um, and we're very interested in, in possibly using that to control shyness. Um, there are still some non-target uh, issues to be worked out, um, but that may prove to be a, a, an agent that we can use in Hawaii. And then uh, uh, the number of agents been developed by collaborators for uh, uh, serving Fiji and Cook Islands, um, targeting uh, African tulip tree. Um, and so we may end up being interested in that for Hawaii. Um, and then we have a number of invasive grasses in Hawaii um, that originate in Africa, um, including the, the worst of those is fountain grass. Uh, but there are others, and we're, we are very keenly interested in the collaborations that have uh, begun in recent years and uh, the potential for, for actually having effective biocontrol of grasses. And then shifting gears slightly, I'd like to highlight uh, a need that we have, having worked in biocontrol for so long, Hawaii has pretty aging infrastructure. So we are looking now into uh, updating our biocontrol facilities and considering the options. And one of the one of those possibilities that we're considering is uh, whether a modular sort of design uh, might might be an effective uh, cost effective and uh, and uh, generally more effective way of, of building a new facility. So we are looking into that. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll add uh, a bit to Paul's presentation about uh, strawberry guava and where we're heading now. Uh, this shows a thicket of strawberry guava overwhelming uh, the uh, native forest with the emergent native forest trees that are dwindling. Um, and this gall forming agent has been released widely in the state. Um, and as Paul mentioned, it, it doesn't fly, it spreads by wind. Um, it's tiny offspring uh, are spread by wind. Um, so we were concerned that it's not going to spread very well on its own. And we've developed a number of techniques, as Paul mentioned, including uh, uh, the tectobola, the way of throwing it up into the canopy um, in a galled leaf. And uh, our evaluation of, of the rate of spread um, from the original, one of the original release sites on the Big Island um, shows a, a spread of averaged over, over nine or uh, the nine years that we've measured um, maximum spread of three and a half kilometers. So that's about 400 meters a year. Probably won't be that far and fast in uh, intact forest. And the challenge on the Big Island is we have large areas of forest. So in order to uh, um, improve and, and cut off 50 years of waiting for the, the biocontrol to spread on its own, we're looking into dropping it from the air uh, into just to get it seeded. So um, we expect to make good progress on that over the next couple of years. Um, and then finally, the, that, the, the type of integration of uh, restoration uh, activity that Paul's doing is really uh, important to understand with this biocontrol and many of our, our biocontrols. Since the, 
the end all is is the preservation of our uh, our native forest. And with that, I'll say mahalo and thanks. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was great. Um, so thanks to everybody for sticking with us. We're just a couple minutes over. And with that, I will turn it over to Carrie to close the summit. Thanks so much. Thank you to everybody. Uh, this has been such a great opportunity to learn more about biocontrol across North America. Uh, we'd like to spank, thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share this interesting work. Um, thank you again to the USDA Forest Service for sponsoring the summit and to the NASMA Biocontrol Committee members and NASMA staff for running everything so smoothly. Um, the summit has been recorded and it will be available on the NASMA YouTube channel for later viewing. If you aren't already a member, um, please join NASMA. All members are welcome to join the Biocontrol Committee and get more involved with the work we're doing. If you want more information on this, you can contact me or Jen Andres, and we'll put our uh, emails in the chat box. Um, and then finally, thank you all for joining us today and for sticking with us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the summit, and we really ask you to fill out the post-summit survey that you'll receive shortly. Um, we use this information to help guide our future work in summits, and so it's really worth uh, taking the time if you can. Uh, thank you all again and have a great day.